Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here are your hosts, John Joseph Adams and David Barr Kirtley. Hi, this is Dave. And this is John. And welcome to episode 84 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Austin Grossman, a game design consultant currently working on the Dishonored series from Arcane Studios. His first novel, Soon I Will Be Invincible, told from the point of view of a comic book supervillain, was released in 2007. His latest book, You, is about a young man who goes to work for a successful video game company founded by his high school friends. Then stick around after the interview as we talk video games with Ted Kazmatka, a writer who works for Valve, creators of Half-Life and Portal. This episode also features a special presentation of Dave's fantasy short story, Save Me Please. All right, so let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Austin Grossman. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so to start with, how did you first get interested in game design? My parents, for reasons I'll never understand, bought a really early computer. They bought a Sinclair uh, ZX81, which came with BASIC uh, hardwired in. And so the kids in my family learned BASIC, and for some reason the thing... The things that it occurred to me to do was try, was try to mess around with weird graphics patterns and to try to make games with it. And then when we graduated to the Apple IIe, some early games that were distributed, like Load Runner, came with the level editors included. So I, I, I messed around with it. And I, but then I have to admit that like, I didn't really play any games after I left high school. I went through four years of college without messing around with that stuff at all. And then I ended up going back to it because I couldn't, I didn't know what to do after I graduated. And uh, I applied to some jobs in publishing in a kind of aimless way, and I didn't get any. And then I was looking through the Boston Globe, by which mean I mean a physical periodical printed on paper. Uh, and I was looking in the classified section, and there was an ad for a video game design job. I mean, it was sort of irresistible. I didn't really think, I didn't have the idea in my head that it was a job until I saw it in a newspaper. Well, in the book, uh, Russell gets hired despite having no particular qualifications. Uh, was it really that easy to get a job in gaming back in uh, 97 or whatever? Or uh, was that a little dramatic license? It was a little dramatic license. For me, it was 92 when the industry was, I think, more of a hobbyist, niche enterprise. But the short answer is, apparently it was. Do you think that's still possible today, that you could be a 28-year-old English major and get hired as a game designer? Not without some special circumstances, no. It's hugely more competitive now. Uh, I mean, you could certainly major in English. I don't think, I don't know any game developers who have a major bias toward hiring people that come out of the game design, undergraduate game design programs. Majoring in English is not at all a strike against you, because part of what game designers do is tell stories. But you would have to have a little, a little more going on for you. Uh, you'd have to ha have some programming competence. You'd want to have some prototype games or, or game concepts. You'd have to have a really good vocabulary for analyzing why games are fun, how game mechanics work, and why they have the effect on the player experience that they do. I mean, you'd have to have your game design swagger going to get that job. But it was a different deal in the, in the 90s. I, I actually believe that it was. And then in the in the novel, the main characters, when they were in high school, they, they all went to this programming summer camp. Uh, did you ever go to anything like that? Or was that based on anything? No, I never went to I never went to computer camp. I found on the internet an amazing brochure for a computer camp in 1983. And I downloaded the brochure and it's incredible. Like the photographs are incredible of like the dorky campers having a good time with their computers. Anyway, I just fantasized about what it would be like to be at a computer. Camp. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, sort of, I mean, Richard Garriott, I think, went to a camp like that, which is where he was christened Lord British. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, a lot of my friends did. And yet, I did not. <laughs> okay, so your bio describes you as a game design consultant. So what exactly do you do? Most of what I end up doing is actually is doing writing for games uh, rather than game design. A lot of the time, there isn't enough work as a writer for a company to retain a full-time writer. Maybe you're coming in late in the project, and they just 
need some dialogue written or they fall behind schedule and they just need to get more person hours in there. Maybe it's early in the design process and they're trying to figure out how to build a story around their kind of signature game mechanic. It happens differently uh, with, with different projects. Like, are you working on site when you do that or do you do it all remotely? Because because you work for Arcane Studios, right? And they're based in Austin, but you live in California, right? Yes. Uh, I insist on spending a couple of weeks on site throughout the course of the job. There's kind of no substitute for the group mind thing that happens when you're on site. You know, these, these games are they're designed off site by sort of by telephone. They don't have that same aesthetic coherence. You know, I was looking at the list of games you've worked on, and a really high percentage of them are these very well-known, well-respected franchises. We've got Ultima, System Shock, Deus Ex, Thief, Tomb Raider, and Dishonored. Uh, was that just good luck that you ended up working on all these great games, or uh, did you have some career strategy, or how did that work? Career strategy? That would have been something to think about. <laughs> um, at this like No, that's good luck. I mean, most of that good luck comes from having gone to work at a place called Looking Glass Technologies back in uh, Cambridge in the mid-90s. That was a studio that was founded, something like 91 or so, and built around one of the first working real-time 3D engines at the same time that the guys were doing, the id guys were doing uh, Castle of Funstein. And this is Ultima Underworld? Yeah, uh, yes, Ultima Underworld. So I was really, I mean, those were the guys who put the ad in the paper, uh, I went, and they were a whole. They were a bunch of super smart guys who were super passionate about games. They were kind of my founding education in what the medium was about, and they were guys that stuck around and worked on amazing games. And then, either left the company or when the company broke up, they moved to other companies and were still willing to hire me. It, this was luck. I got in right at the start, knowing the right people. Isn't it possible that these games were all awesome because you worked on them? Isn't that like you're the the singular thing they all share? No, I know that's it's kind of Occam's Razor. Actually, no, let's go with that. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> I should have should have let off for that one. <laughs> uh, so your new novel, you, is set primarily in 1997. Uh, was there something special about that era in gaming that made you want to focus on that? That is a really good question. I spent the early stages of the writing process kind of dithering about the setting, part of me said to myself, okay, this is stupid. If you don't set it in 2012, no one's going to care. When you go back to 1997, it's hard to think of games that are relevant. There's, there's no Halo, there's no Half-Life, there's nothing. So I, I kicked around different moments in time, and then I thought to myself, okay, just you have to pick one, and you have to be specific, and you have to look at what that era is, is about. So yes, I picked 97. I picked it for a bunch of reasons. It's just the moment when we're starting to get the uh, the Quake engine. The big technological change that's starting to happen is 3D accelerator cards. What makes the, um, the, the graphics cards important is that now you're starting to support bigger and bigger levels of detail, higher resolution textures, more and more polygons on screen, which means that production values are going up, which means you need more artists and, and 3D modelers to make your world look correct, which makes the production process more cumbersome, which means it's much more team-based and collaborative. You can't do it with five people anymore, right? You, you start to get, you need 15 people or 50 people. It was when it started to seem just possible that games and movies could kind of merge, so everybody wanted to do it, but nobody knew how to do it. As graphics technology gets better, one thing you can definitely see is the loss of a signature graphic design style associated with video games, right? Like, if you want to put up an icon to signify video games, you put up a Space Invader or you put up a Pac-Man. You put up an 8-bit pixel art thing and people know what you're talking about. When video games started to get to be able to pretend to look like movies, they started to look like crappy movies instead of their own uh, distinctive quality, right? That sense of uh, flat shaded polygons as a distinctive look or wireframe or pixel art. Like within those technical limitations, they did cool aesthetic stuff, right? But once you started to be able to like animate crappy looking people in airplanes, they just did crappy looking people in airplanes. And they look like crappy movies with a lot of lens flare and bloom on them. And that's a little sad. And it's, it's something that I think we're coming out the other side of. 
with the indie games movement. So which parts of the book are based the most on your own experiences and which did you take the most dramatic license with? Well, clearly later in the, in the book, there was a sort of big dramatic crisis that would have to be fiction, although it would be cool if, we're, if it were not fiction. But honestly, I, I tried to stick a, a, as much as possible to the nuts and bolts of game development, of the real kind of rituals of it, the morning meetings, the different phases of, of the project, the different problems that you have when you're designing a level. I mean, I cut and pasted that stuff <laughs> into the novel. And I thought that was kind of important to do. I mean, video games are a huge, incredibly popular, exciting, world-transforming medium. And it's odd how little attention is paid to how they are made. A lot of gamers or people who play a lot of video games don't really understand how they're made or the day-to-day of it or the frustration of it or the odd little problem-solving that goes into it. Well, like, just speaking of the frustration, I mean, one section that really struck me was where the it's just going through all the different ways the players could break the game by just doing some annoying, you know, thing that they're not intended to. It was kind of reminding me of, you know, when I was a dungeon master uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons in high school, and I would, you know, make this incredibly complicated story and stuff. And then I would start out the story and say, okay, you meet this peasant woman. And the players would be like, tell her we want to see her panties. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. Damn it. <laughs> um, and that's when I decided I was going to go into uh fiction because then i wouldn't have to deal with stuff like that but well and there's two ways of looking at that i mean on one side it's incredibly frustrating i mean the trial by fire is when you make a level and you get someone to play test that level and the only true way to play test that level properly is to let them play through it without intervening and it sounds simple but it's incredibly difficult You can watch someone bumble around your level for 20 minutes looking for like this one obvious door or ladder that you put in. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, okay, I'll just tell them where the ladder is because no one else is going to have this problem, right? That's what you tell yourself. Mm -hmm. And like, unless your friends physically restrain you, you will tell them and then you will ship that level with the ladder that no one can find. The other side of it though is that players will try to do the wrong thing. Players will know what you want them to do a lot of the time, and they will simply not do it out of what feels like sheer perversity, but I think there's an actual reason for it, which is that players want to own their own story. The most thrilling thing, if you are a video game player, is to live the story that's only your story, or the story that you chose, even if it means mucking up the rest of the game. Basically, they are, they are Lucifer in, 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 in Paradise Lost. They simply re- rebel against the, the universe's architect for the sheer thrill of the feeling of having free will. And I think that's a profound truth about game design that needs to be understood and worked with rather than rigorously stamped out. Because the impulse as a game designer, as an interactive storyteller, is just to go into siege warfare and just reinforce your story so rigorously that no one can possibly do anything but follow the story that you set out in the world. And that is this kind of success that also kind of kills the medium in a way, or kills that what's so distinct about the medium. I mean, one thing that really struck me reading this is that Russell seems to have this dream job, but he's very unsure about whether this is the right thing to do. He's like, should I have gone to law school? Am I a dork for doing this job? How common are those sorts of feelings in the industry, do you think? I think there are a couple of different answers. One is that it was less, it was less cool, it was less of a, a dream job in the 90s than it is now when people recognize it more as a career. There are days when you can't escape the feeling that other people in the world are doctors <laughs> and other people in the world are architects who are at least building things in reality. And then then the the other times when you're in the industry and you think to yourself, I am architecting a medium that no one has ever experienced before. And I'm creating, I'm exploring an area of of feeling and storytelling that has literally never happened in this way before. And when you go to give a lecture or teach a class on game design at a college and 
you look at how passionate the people are who, who show up to that and they care about it and they've played every game and you think, oh God, I am plugged into the most important thing that I could possibly be doing right now. It's, the, the, the truth is simply both ways. You just have one, you have one kind of day and then you have another kind of day. And that's, uh, <laughs> it's probably true in a lot of jobs. Well, I, I really liked the line where Russell, he's looking at these business guys who share their office building and he thinks to himself, I make dragons. What the hell do you make? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the feeling a lot of the time. And you try to capture that feeling. And then there are days when you can't. But there are days, there are definitely a lot of days when you can. And it's completely awesome. Uh, so Michael Moorcock's magic sword, Mornblade, plays a major role in the book. Have you gotten any feedback from Moorcock about that? No, I haven't. Why haven't I? Why did I not think? <clears throat> Because I guess I think of, of him as like Melville. I think of him as in the cloud somewhere as an American, you know, a canonical American author who does not British. have, uh, or British author. <laughs> See, I don't really think about Michael Moorcock. <laughs> I kind of didn't, I, it's, it's hard for me to think of him as a real person because how could a real <laughs> person invent Elric? That is not something that a real person could do. Um, <laughs> so I just it slips, it just slips my mind that that could actually be a real person. Okay, so back in episode 48, we interviewed your twin brother, Lev Grossman. And the way that your book deconstructs fantasy games is similar in some ways to the way that his novel, The Magicians, deconstructs fantasy novels. So I was just wondering, do you see any parallels between the two books, and do the two of you bounce ideas off each other or anything like that? Mm, I thought this question was going to go to Codex, um, but I guess it didn't. I haven't read, I haven't read Codex, so I'm not sure what, what happens. Is that a better example? Uh, it, it deals directly with, with uh, video games. And there's a mystery, and there's a lot of video game sequences, and and so forth. But um, answer to the answer to the second part, yes, we do talk about ideas in early stages. There is a recognizable breaking point when I get so desperate and either stuck or just despise what I'm working on so much that I cannot stand it, or that that it starts to feel worse than sending it to him. Then I send it to him. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to go through a certain amount of agony before I will, mm -hmm. I will actually do that. But it is invariably uh helpful you know and we exchange manuscripts we do all of that i i have a small number of outside readers but he is always the the first one that an idea will go to and it's generally like i'm doing something weird and i i can't figure out where it's going so it's like can can you see where i'm going with this because i can no longer see where i'm going with this or like this seemed like such a great smart idea but now it seems like i've done the worst thing in the world just look at it you know as to why we do the work we do, I, I don't know. I think we do slightly different things, which is actually good news. If we had, if our work were, had too much in common, I think it would be weird and harder to do. Although, obviously, yes, we do take the material of genre and uh, mess around with it a good deal. When it's it's very um, metafictional, almost, or sort of self-aware about genre conventions. Um, do you think maybe that comes from? I mean, Lev told us that he that writing a fantasy novel was almost an act of rebellion for him, because uh, your parents disapproved of fantasy. Do you think uh, some uh, aspect of like thinking a lot about the value of fantasy and what it means to people comes out of that? Or I think it's complex. I mean, the first novel of any length that I ever read was read to me, uh, was read to the both of us by our father, which was The Hobbit. So. Uh, it's not as if they tried to wall us off from fantasy. It's a difficult question because it's such a basic question. Why the hell we're doing what we're doing with writing? I mean, you, you call it metafictional. I don't really think of it in very intellectual terms. When I sat down to write Soon I Will Be Invincible, my first novel about superhero characters, I did it because, em honestly, emotionally, I couldn't find a way to talk that felt satisfying. And I knew I had this attachment to, to superhero comics and superhero storytelling. And I, I felt it very deeply. But I felt that, by and large, the, the stories that had been told with, with superheroes and supervillains, they felt incomplete to me. Or they felt, it felt like there was some voice or some, some emotional truth that was being glossed over or something. Or I felt like there was a way of speaking through it that, was going to be satisfying, was going to let me speak the terrible truths that I needed to speak. And so honestly, I didn't come to it thinking to myself, aha, genre fiction, I will mess with you, hmm. you know, because I am so smart. I didn't actually come to it that way. 
Although I, it certainly, from the outside, looks as if I did. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, certainly there there are certain authors who sort of dabble in fantasy where you kind of get the feeling that they're posers and they don't actually love the stuff or know that much about it. And that's unquestionably not the case here. I mean, this book is full of just the most obscure fantasy references of, of anything I've ever read. I mean, it's very clear that you love the genre and, and know it uh, inside and out. Yeah, I mean, Lev and I are, are both long, you know, steeped in that stuff. I don't like to play the authenticity game, but you know when somebody's being arch about a subject and they, they don't really love it or they don't really know it well enough to have the right to be arch about it. Uh, and like, you can tell when someone's doing that and, it, and it's irritating. And I, I think, I don't think we have that problem. When people talk about the magicians uh, as a satire or fantasy, I think that's kind of incorrect, right? It's easy to make fun of genre fiction. Like that's not what the magicians did. That's not what, you know, the invincible did, right? They, played with it like and they they messed with it and they they speak through it because they love it because they think it's the greatest thing ever and honestly like magicians is a great fantasy book it's not a takedown of fantasy right it's ridiculous i guess when, when i when i say it's metafic when i say you is metafictional i'm thinking in particular of the way that the characters the four kind of archetypal rpg characters um or was it lorak and brennan you know you know oh, yes yes Yes, that, yes. That we're not, they're not just fantasy characters, but they're fantasy characters that we're meant to think about as the way that fantasy characters are presented in games and in fiction. No, uh, yeah, absolutely. And you is much more directly metafictional. Like it, 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 it analyzes a, a medium as, a, as it works with it. That's, that's completely true. And it, it, it seemed to be unavoidable when we're, we're writing about game development. And coming to write about video games was a very different experience than writing about comic books, I have to say. Uh, it ended up getting more more analytical and more self-conscious for various reasons. I think partly because it's about, the book is about a young artist kind of coming to understand the medium he's working in. And partly because video games are such an odd medium that we're still working out the basics of, uh, that we end up having to talk through a bunch of the problems. And part of it, I think a lot of the worry was that like, I wasn't sure what audience is going to come to and pick up you right is it going to be the people who know the medium backwards and forwards or or is it going to be people who who read genre novels and sort of know about gaming but uh need some of it explained to them we will uh we will discover that or neither or or maybe no one will ever read it ever <laughs> we, will, we will discover <laughs> later this month <laughs> well i mean i'm certainly i'm the sort of person who would read it but it does seem that you made a real effort to explain things to people who aren't into gaming. I mean, everyone, I mean, Russell is kind of a um, innocent abroad in a way that people have to explain to him what E3 is and, you know, what a, a level editor is. And, and so therefore the reader is explained those things as well. Yeah, that was tricky. And the book is written for two audiences and it has to, it has to negotiate that path. People who read the work in progress were, were by and large people who didn't play many video games. Uh, and I tried to keep it that way just to make sure I wasn't walling out people who didn't who didn't know about games one of the things i look forward to learning when the book is released is kind of how many people knew this stuff and how how many people didn't how mainstream are games are video games that that's kind of a basic question that no one seems to have a good handle on okay so uh, i mean one conflict in the novel is between the programmer character lisa who hates stories and games and the english major character russell who wants stories uh where do you come down in that debate Honestly, by and large, I am an anti-narrativist. I am a, I'm a, I, I am a ludicist or a ludologist. That is to say, I push towards simulation-driven dynamic systems rather than designer-authored stories. By and large, I gave Lisa the part of speaking things that I mostly believe. Although, see, the other day, like, I was at PAX recently, and I, I was on this panel about narrative design, and I was ranting about how you know stories need to be driven by players and player experience rather than designers but then god i like a week later i picked up an incredible indie game called 30 flights of loving which is it costs like 5 bucks on steam and it's completely linear and it is completely designer and authored and it, it is the inc most incredible you know narrative game i've played through in years and years and it just kind of like it made me realize that i should shut up because I don't, I don't know anything. So in the opening chapter, uh, the protagonist, Russell, goes for a job interview at a video game company. And one of the questions he's asked 
is what is your ultimate game? How would you answer that question? There are a number of answers to that question. One answer is like, if I had a good answer, I would not have written the novel because the <laughs> novel was a kind of book length attempt to come to grips with that question. Another answer is, is the kind of metagame or anthology game that is enacted in the progress of the book, which is to say, you know, the, the book kind of uh, recapitulates the history of video and computer games or more computer games since 83. But it has that thing where, where, where all the games in it are backwards compatible. So you can keep migrating your save game from your primitive ASCII, you know, roguelike dungeon game to your, you know, 3D galaxy simulation. And like, I want the game that does that. I want the game that walks me through all the genres in the history of gaming and yet plays them as a single sequential evolving simulation. But uh, honestly, the, the real answer is, <laughs> is, you know, that's the question that makes you keep de designing games and, and developing more games is that you just, is, 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 that keeps pushing the medium forward, right? Is that, that, that you're pushing that question. And ne you know that next year's game are going to make this year's games look pathetic. <laughs> and and that, that never stops, right? It's, it's an asymptotic process where, where or the medium it just continues to evolve. So I don't know if I, I could answer it, but then I would have to answer it again the, the following year. Mm -hmm. So has the title you caused a lot of confusion? Because I can just imagine a lot of conversations where you say, like, I'm doing an event for you tomorrow. And someone says, for me, how nice. And then you say, no, no, not for you, for my book. No, no, the whole thing is a fucking, uh, you know, uh, can I swear on the podcast or not? Yeah, that's fine. Go okay. for it. All right. The whole thing is, is, it, is it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a spinal tap deleted scene. And it is, has been from day one. And it's so fucking horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I offered to change the title. Uh, and Michael Peach at Little Brown said, no, it's a good title. Keep it. And Michael Peach edited The Pale King and is a genius. So I said, yes, sir. And I like the title. The title is kind of in your face. Uh, it's very sort of intrinsically part of the medium it's talking about. So I kind of love it. I love it. And it has, it has a kind of enduring, kind of exciting charge to me that like it's always throwing itself back on the, on the reader. It always has this question to it, which is, you know, okay, you know, it's not me, it's you. So who, who are you? At the same time, it's, it's a horrible pain. It's why I, I, adv I added the subtitle, you know, you a novel to the cover just because I'm so sick of it. <laughs> mm. um, but the, I, I have not yet found a, a reliable, elegant way around it. So I've yet to do any kind of interview or, or significant conversation about the book that does not contain some kind of mistake or jokey attempt to diffuse the weird confusion of it. Um, mm. And yes, this is, this is the rest of my life. I've done this to myself. <laughs> and it's, it's never going to stop. Well, I mean, you had a book called Soon I Will Be Invincible, and then you. Is it safe to say that the next book will involve the word we or me or us or something? Oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, I Do already you have, like, know a the pronoun title. thing going on? I already know the title to my next book. Uh, so I uh, can answer that uh, by saying that it does not contain any pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you can't tell us what the actual You can't tell us the title, though? Uh, the, the title of the next book is Crooked. It is the secret story of richard nixon does it have any like superhero or fantasy elements or anything or is it a realistic novel it does and i will i have not even say any more than that okay. but yes <laughs> uh, we are it has its genre component but i'm gonna i'm gonna leave that a mystery for now okay so i'm a huge fan of the ultima series and we mentioned that you worked on ultima underworld 2 mm -hmm. uh, have you been following the um ultima forever and shroud of the avatar stuff and what's your take on that uh, I haven't enough, uh, I have to say. I think Richard Garriott is a really interesting kind of disruptive intelligence. You know, I think Ultima Online was a very interesting experiment. Uh, I think he's bound to do something interesting, but I have not actually uh, read up on what he's doing with Shroud. But I'm kind of glad that he's getting back into it. He has a tendency to change the landscape, and that is a good thing. I guess maybe I should just explain to people that Richard Garriott's Ultima IP was sold to Electronic Arts. And so Ultima Forever, they're making a game called Ultima Forever, and he's making a game called Shroud of the Avatar, both of which are basically Ultima games, except he can't use their IP and they can't use his IP, which is like <laughs> his character uh, of Word British. And so it's just a weird situation. We see a lot of this. like We see it with like Ron Gilbert and like a lot of these Kickstarters, like the guys who made the Space Quest games, where the actual creators end up 
20 years later wanting to make a new game in their franchise and they can't because they don't own the IP, but no one else is really using it. And it's just kind of an un unfortunate situation. Yeah, although, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Like Walt Disney lost control of the IP of Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, which caused him to create Mickey Mouse. Because he left, he left his job and he left the rights to his first character there. And Oswald, if you look at him, and, or if you played Epic Mickey, you know that he looks like a slightly less, of, he's a rabbit, but he looks like a slightly less evolved version of Mickey Mouse. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird situation, but people are smart and, and, and genuinely pushing things forward like Garrett. Like, yeah, they're going to they're gonna cope and do something cool with it. And sometimes it helps. Sometimes it helps to be cut off from, from your IP. Like, you can't help but think that Garrett was a little bit imprisoned by the ultimate IP, uh, don't you think? Well, I I'm, I'm, I'm editorializing. <laughs> well, I mean, no, that's what, you know, that's the, what the show is for. But I mean, at least personally, I, there was a, a real, um, life, I, I feel sort of like life enriching quality to go back to the same world installment after installment and see how the things had changed and remember these places I had visited when I was 12 years old and, and see them, you know, still alive. And I always imagined I would be showing my kids, like, you know, taking my kids to Britannia and taking them to those places and, in Ultima 25 or something. And it's just sad to me. It's sad that the franchise is kind of. Yeah. Although, I mean, I have two things like one is like the guys at EA, like they can't be so incredibly inept as not to, at some point plan to make a deal with Gary. Like, how would you not do that? You know, if you own that IP, how much is that IP worth with Richard Garriott versus without Richard Garriott? Like surely someone can do the math. And second thing, the second thing is that that loops a little bit back to you because that was the process I was writing about in uh, in, in in you the novel, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where the same areas in the world get recreated, and as time passes, you see them through the lens of different game display technologies. And when you brought that up, it reminded me of the feeling that you get when you revisit a place, but you see it more re realistically than you've ever seen it in a game because in earlier iterations of the franchise, you just saw little uh, letters or, 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 or pixel art, and now you're seeing it in 3D. It's a really interesting moment and experience. And it's a unique experience, right? Unique, it's a unique to the medium. It's unique to our cohort's experience of the medium, right? When, we, when we've lived through a, a, a time when the, the, the technology changes so fast. Part of why I wrote the book is there's so many odd experiences that, that never get narrated, that, never, that, that, that don't have, aren't, haven't been given names. And that, that's, that's exactly one of them. Okay, and then before we run out of time, we do want to talk to you a bit about your first novel, Soon I Will Be Invincible. So just what are some of your most memorable experiences surrounding the publication of that book? I mean, there was the big experience of working on the film, which is sort of in development and is kicking around a little bit. There was the experience of, doing, of seeing the concept art for the film and seeing all the characters drawn, which I also got when we did the UK edition and the comics artist Brian Hitch, who's incredibly fucking great, drew all the characters for the UK edition. There was the, man, there was the experience when uh, Dr. Horrible came out, right? Uh, Soon I'll Be Invisible was summer 2007, and then Dr. Horrible came out in, in summer 2008. And then I thought to myself, oh, crap, man. Like, we had the same idea, except this guy is Joss Whedon. <laughs> 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 um, and, but I had to admit, I, I mean, I love Dr. Horrible. I have to admit that it's really, really good. And there was the bizarre experience that in one of my earliest Hollywood meetings, they were like, okay, who should play Dr. Impossible, do you think? Uh, and I didn't realize they were just being polite to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, uh, Neil Patrick Harris. And I said, but I said that before Dr. Horrible. Hmm. I, just, I just thought to myself, Neil Patrick Harris, super villain. Fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they, didn't, they didn't care. But I, I, I'm so proud of having called that. Um, and actually, like, just God, just a few weeks ago, someone said to me, you know, I think maybe... I know someone who knows someone who knows Neil Patrick Harris. I could give them your book. And I, and I actually sent him an, an inscribed copy that may or may not get actually passed to him with this narrative uh, attached to it. Um, but my other story, sorry, and then I will shut up. Uh, I, then this is all, these are all Dr. Horrible stories. I went to Comic-Con in 2000, summer 2008, and I was like, uh, I've still kept still a little bit feeling the burn of, of Dr. Horrible <laughs> and feeling like this thing was getting a lot of attention and, and I had done something similar. And then, but like, I really liked it. So I went to the cast, like, viewing sing-along of Dr. Horrible. And I'm sitting in this line 
and if you've ever been to Comic-Con, it was, this is one of the hour-long waits, right? And it's night. It's like showing at like nine at night. So the, so the convention center is dark. Everybody's just sitting in this line, like on the floor in this convention center. And it's kind of empty. And like somebody comes walking down the line, you know, and, and it's because of the it's convention centers. You can see them like half a mile away. And they're approaching and they come and they stop in front of me. And they hold out a copy of Soon I Will Be Invincible and said, could you sign this? And suddenly, like, all of my resentment of Dr. Horrible fell away. <laughs> because I just thought to myself, man, we all like stuff, you know? And some people actually read this book and like it. It was like, it was like enough to have be recognized by one person. Even though I was in this crowd of people recognizing this other thing, it was enough that one person noticed it. And, and it meant enough that they could figure out who I was. It was kind of awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, was the re the reaction was pretty positive? I mean, did it surprise you at all what people thought about it? Did uh, people see in it things that you were just like, "Wow, I never even considered that." I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it was my first novel. The fact that it was published at all was just is an ongoing shock from which <laughs> I have, I have not recovered. Uh, I mean, I wrote it when I was in grad school. I wrote it as a private goof around project just to kind of write the you know weirdest dumbest thing I could. Well, didn't you, you said something like I wanted to ruin the workshop I was in? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I was at Berkeley uh, in the doctoral program there, and they didn't have an MFA, but they did have some fiction workshops. And yeah, I mean, I wanted to lower the tone. I wanted to, here I was, I was studying 19th century literature. I wanted to goof around, and I also wanted to, I wanted to be stupid. I wanted to annoy people, you know? And it, it was much less of a thing to write about comic books and prose back then, because this was 2001. This was before even Jonathan Leeson's Fortress of Solitude. Uh, so the comic book novel wasn't a thing at, at the time. So it seemed that much stupider to be doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I totally did wrote it to irritate people. I wrote it to irritate people who were still trying to, to write uh, Ann Beattie stories or Raymond Carver stories. Uh, I, I mean, I came of age as a fiction writer in the 80s and 90s when it was all minimalism, right? And it was all very slow, tiny moments in somebody's kitchen, right? Uh, I, I wanted to blow the lid off that, right? I wanted color. I wanted action. I wanted energy. I wanted the supernatural. I wanted, you know, I wanted all that great stuff that the genre brings in. So, I mean, yeah, Sonobi Films was kind of a fuck you, right? To the fiction tradition that I had been brought up to revere. But yeah, it, 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 at the time, it was the time to to write something so great and so stupid that the world could not handle it. That was what I was hoping to do. Have you ever seen or heard it? Heard about anyone uh, cosplaying from any of the characters from the book? Man, you know, <laughs> I wish I could say that I had. I honestly do. I was at Vericon, and the guest of honor was Brandon Sanderson, and like everybody was cosplaying as his characters, and I was like, uh. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, that is that has become a life goal. Uh, at PAX this year, I hung out with people who were cosplaying from Dishonored, so at least that was that was something. But yeah. Um, it has yet to happen, unless you count my own private exercises. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think like to, to get people to cosplay your characters, you have to have one character who's just a really easy costume to do. Like, you know, he wears a yellow T-shirt and carries a garbage can lid or something. And then people are like, well, I, I didn't have time to do a real costume, but this <laughs> this will be easy. No, no. Yeah, I mean, I could have done yeah, something simpler and more distinctive you know what that's one of, that's a first novelist's mistake if you will <laughs> you don't, you don't uh, think through and also i was i mean to, uh, to some degree i was creating people as types i think and uh, i gave them a kind of generality uh that said like i'm still i'm sitting on the amazing concept art for the soon i'll be invincible film and if that stuff ever got out mm -hmm. that would be that would be the time so yeah i mean you said it's in development is there any is it in development hell or is it um can we look forward to it like what's the status of that it does it does feel like hell i don't know if there's a technical <laughs> term for it uh i've written screenplay i'm going to tell you very little because there's a lot that i'm not allowed to tell you uh basically we want to find the right director the market for uh superhero films is, is still around and if anything like the audience is more sophisticated and the the scarcity of original ideas given the reboots that we're seeing uh is more and more glaringly apparent. I think it would be an awesome film. Obviously, they did Mega Mind, and then they did uh, Despicable Me. Not that I mind that they did those things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they should do Cinema of the Invisible. It would be such an awesome film. It's an awesome character. 
Um, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to do when you're not pushing Marvel or DC IP, right? You know, I think people who want to make that film want to know that it has that pre-existing market. But I feel, still think it would be an awesome idea. And the script is actually uh, came out really well. Uh, the first version of which was done weirdly by Dan Weiss, now famous for Game of Thrones. He is one of the uh, sort of showrunners. And then I did my own draft. Anyway, that's where that sits. But my agent and I have sworn a blood, blood oath that before we die, there will be a film. So you <laughs> <laughs> can look forward to that. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of that book, uh, you know, it's about a supervillain, and, and you also wrote a story for uh, my anthology, The Mad Scientist Guide to World Domination, uh, which was called Professor Incognito Apologizes and Itemizes List. Uh, you want to just briefly mention what that's about? Oh, yes. I mean, The Mad Scientist Guide to World Domination uh, is a really good anthology, I have to say, uh, owing very little to my own. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to revisit the subject of uh, of Mad Scientist because you know, so not being invisible, I thought to myself, maybe I've said what I had to say. But it turned out to be really interesting. Basically, like, it's a mad scientist who has a girlfriend. And the problem of having a girlfriend and being a mad scientist, a, a secret mad scientist at the same time, just generates its own interesting uh, plot developments. And it turned out to be incredibly fun. And I think that's probably the story that makes me think that there will be a Sinal will be, soon I'll be Invincible sequel down the road because I thought to myself, wow, I am actually really not done with this voice and this premise. So do you consider that story to take place in the same world as soon I will be invincible or is it just sort of uh, similar, but not the same world? The world of soon I'll be invincible is a capacious place. I have to say there's no reason it couldn't, I, you know what I should have done. A, I should have done a real call out to actually solidify that as, as it is. I wouldn't, I can't really call it canon. But ah, I should have uh, I should have just mm -hmm. done like one character cameo, just as a throwaway that said it in that universe. That would have been smart. Uh, <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, we mentioned earlier that you really know your stuff when it comes to fantasy and science fiction. Do you think you might ever write just a straight out epic fantasy or a space opera? That's a ah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you is a novel that spans genres, right? Because the game company in it has a fantasy franchise and it has a, a espionage franchise and a space opera franchise. And it, it was my chance to kind of tour through those genres. And I have to say, yes. I mean, this, I don't know which I will do first, but like, I don't know if, if I could do what you call straight, because I don't know if I do anything quite what you, what you call straight, but like, God, I'm so invested in those genres. Like sooner or later, I'm going to come to the moment where it's like, okay, I have to find out what what's in this for me. So, I mean, the answer's got to be yes. I mean, come on, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so we usually wrap things up just by asking about what upcoming projects people have. I mean, you mentioned the movie you're going to get done before you die. Um, Crooked is a uh, what was it? A spy novel or something with genre? It's it, uh, it's just well, I mean, it, it's I would say it's a spy novel. The genre elements in which Richard Nixon is the principal character. It's a Cold War novel from the point of view of Richard Nixon. Uh, and it, it has some genre twist in it that I'm not going to go into right now. Uh, of course, You is coming out on April 16th uh, or April 25th in the UK. And uh, it's going to be cool. I'm so looking forward to the 16th. Uh, and we'll be doing events and probably some online events and God, people who are interested in games in any way should check it out. Uh, I honestly, I have had my moments when I did not have confidence in it, but now I think it's interesting enough that people should get it. <laughs> Crooked is probably going to come out next year. I'm working on, of course, uh, the Dishonored franchise, the game franchise, and our downloadable story arc is coming out also April 16th. Uh, so I have, uh, I have a bunch of stuff going on. All right, great. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So Austin Grossman, thanks so much for joining us on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, thanks so much, you guys. I had a great time. And that was our interview. So thanks so much to Austin Grossman for joining us on the show. And as we mentioned, for our panel today, we'll be talking about video games and just going into a bit more depth about some of the issues that came up during the interview. And we're joined by a special guest geek, Ted Kosmatka. His short fiction has been reprinted in nine Year's Best anthologies, and he's also a full-time writer at Valve, creators of Half-Life. His second novel, Prophet of Bones, is out now. So, Ted, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. All right, and so one of the things that came up during the interview is the issue of how easy was it to get hired at a video game company in 1997. <laughs> and uh, I know a little bit about this. Uh, 
when I was in high school, my friend Pete and I were really, really, really into Doom. And then uh, I graduated and went off to college. And so while I was at college, I talked to Pete. And he says, hey, you know, John Romero, one of the guys who made Doom, has left to start his own company called Ion Storm, and they're hiring. So I think I'm going to apply for a job as a concept artist. And I was like, why would they possibly hire a high school kid to be a concept artist? I'm sure they're going to hire somebody who's worked in comics, you know. And, uh, and he's like, well, I'm going to apply anyway. So he applies. And then I hear from a, him a couple months later. And he says, well, they didn't hire me as a concept artist. You know, they hired somebody from Marvel. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I figured. And he says, but they did hire me as a 3D modeler. Oh. And, yeah. and I was like, well, he had no experience whatsoever doing 3D modeling. And I was so jealous because, I mean, you know, I've been designing pen and paper role-playing games my whole life and programming computer games my whole life. And I was building Doom levels and I was, I taught him how to play Doom. And I was like, wow, how could he get hired? But what had basically happened was that John Romero had kind of gotten fired from id software the company that made doom because they felt like he was playing video games all day and so when he started his own company he's like all right well this is going to be a company where everyone plays video games all day and <laughs> so one of the primary qualifications for getting hired was could you beat him at doom <laughs> and so pete was oh. pete, pete beat him at doom and so uh, that was a big part in how he got hired so i was i was really jealous so i hear i'm a i'm a freshman in college and then pete's off like living in a mansion and driving this fancy sports car and dating models and all this stuff. There was a lot of money involved at Ion Storm. Uh, unfortunately, they, they lost all of it. <laughs> if this is the, the game he was working on it was Daikatana. It's sort of a legendary fiasco in gaming. But so I know for a fact that you could get a job in 1997 with no uh, experience whatsoever. I actually, after college, I moved out there. I was, I was sort of trying to get into the video game industry as a writer and so we would go out to bars with all these people who worked in gaming and Pete would introduce me and he's like, you guys need a writer. And they're like, no, why would you need a writer for video games? You know? <laughs> and, uh, but at one point they were going to hire a writer for Deus Ex 2 and people at the companies by that point had read my short fiction. They're like, oh, you should apply for that. You know, you're really good. And so I, I had emailed this guy who, who was going to interview me and uh, he kept saying, yeah, yeah, come in, you know, just wait a couple weeks, wait a couple more weeks, come in for an interview. And so I kept waiting and waiting and waiting. And then finally, there was one week where I went to Europe with my parents. And I was like, the second day I was there, I get an email from this guy and he says, Hey, can you come in tomorrow for an interview? And I was like, well, no, I'm in Europe, but I'd really, I'm really interested in the job. I'll be back next week. I hope we can do it then. And then I get back and I email him and I don't hear anything. And I hear sort of through the grapevine that they already hired someone else while I was <laughs> gone. And that guy had no qualifications. So. I know in 2001 as well, <laughs> you could get into gaming with no qualifications. Oh man, that's a that's a rough story. <laughs> <laughs> so the big question: Could you beat your friend in Doom? Because yeah, you could. Oh well, oh man, that is rough. Then. <laughs> no man, nobody could beat me in Doom in 1997. No, don't even, <laughs> don't even try. But so what was so that's what it was like then. But so Ted, I mean, you just got hired at Valve within the past few years, so. What was it like uh, now uh, when you did it? I think uh, Valve is a lot like this massive ant colony where there's like every, there's all these different specialists that are out there, and and you just have to find uh, a niche where you're very very good at the at the one thing you do, and then that can somehow you know attract attention to yourself and sort of present yourself in a way that uh, the company says, all right, this is the person that could that could fit in this niche here at the company. And in my case, I think it was probably all the year's best anthologies that I was in. I doubt I would have gotten hired by them if it wasn't for that. But also, John Joseph Adams uh, definitely had a part in that. I don't know if he ever told you that story, but he was the one who introduced me to Mark Laidlaw, who, uh, who's another uh, writer at Valve, and sort of got the conversation started. And uh, Mark, I, I sent Mark a bunch of my stories, and then, you know, one thing sort of led to another, and the, you know, several months later, I was moving my whole life across country and uh, starting over in Seattle as a as a video game writer. So it was definitely a big shift for me. Previous to that, I just worked in a, in a research laboratory. I, I worked with electron microscopes, and so I didn't really have any expectation in my life of being able to work in video games. I'd always wanted to, 
but uh, just you know, I didn't I didn't have any background in it. Uh, I had a background in in being a, basically a lab rat, and I had a, a background in writing short stories. So somehow those two things combined, and I ended up at Valve. The lab was either uh, Aperture Science or Black Mesa, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It, uh, you know, it's a funny story. So when, so when I quit my lab job, I, you know, I explained, you know, I was leaving to go write for video games and it was just sort of like, I got this sort of, you know, stare from my boss, like, what, what do you mean? It's, it's like, <laughs> it didn't, didn't really compute. You know, and then after, you know, I, after I, you know, talked to him some more, you know, he sort of pat me on the back. It was like, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta sort of chase your dreams. You know, congratulations. You know, I hope, hope everything's successful. And, you know, and uh, so a year later, I came back and I was wearing an Aperture Laboratory uh, shirt. <laughs> and so I came back to the lab and I was like hanging out with, you know, my old lab buddies. And, uh, you know, my boss walked in. And he's like, wait a second. I thought you I thought you moved to take a video game job. And I could tell he thought that I had, you know, just left to take another lab job because mm-hmm. he saw the Aperture Science shirt I was wearing. And then I had explained to him, no, 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 this is actually part of a video <laughs> game. And, you know, then then, then it was all good again. Yeah, the old "I'm leaving to pursue a career in video games" excuse. So we've all heard that. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Really, I'm, you know, I'm working for a competitor, you know, in another lab. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to add about uh, when I introduced Ted to Mark Laidlaw. It was funny because we were at a convention and we were both represented by the same agent at the time, and we were just having breakfast together. And so Ted, it was the first time I had really gotten to talk to Ted. I think I, I knew him because I had worked at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and we had published a couple of his stories there. And uh, so I was just talking to him really for the first time and so we were getting to know each other and somehow Mark Laidlaw and or Half-Life or Valve got brought up and when I mentioned Mark's name, Ted just his eyes just got real big. He's like, oh my god, you know Mark Laidlaw? And I was like, well, I mean, kind of. I, I sort of know him to email him because I worked at the magazine and we had published a couple of his stories. Yeah, Ted just got really excited and says, well, I mean, I guess I could try to introduce you by email or something. And so I, and so I did that after the convention. And I mean, I honestly didn't think anything was going to happen about it. I mean, I, I certainly didn't think he would end up going to work at Valve, but it's just like Ted sort of credits me as, as getting in the job at Valve, but it's like I was completely hapless in the situation. It's like I, I, I had no idea that this would happen, but. And then it ended up getting me a sweet tour at the Valve uh, complex in Seattle. So that was nice. Yeah, see, it all, it all comes around. <laughs> Got a nice picture of you uh, next to the portal turret. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know Chet Falasek, who works at Valve, was the first person we ever interviewed on this show. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I know I know Chet well. But all right, so I mean, one of the topics I want to bring up that came up in the interview is this whole issue of story in games. Austin described mm-hmm. himself as a ludologist or something like that. Is that something that gets talked about a lot around the office? When he talked about uh, ludology, I immediately thought, what is that? I, <laughs> I don't know what that is. It made me want to uh, Google it. I have a feeling that he has a really complex, interesting, fascinating, intelligent answer for all that. I just I don't know what it is. <laughs> I wasn't familiar with the term as as he was using it, except that uh, Dave and I had talked previously about ludonarrative dissonance, which was a term I, I was not actually familiar with. But it's a term that sort of describes that disconnect that you have between the the sort of narrative parts of a video game and the game that you're actually playing. I mean, like the classic example of ludonarrative dissonance. I, well, actually, I was just watching um, the new Tomb Raider game, right? And so in the video game portions of the game, Lara Croft kills like 150 people with a rock. And then you get to a cutscene where she's just like, I just don't know if I can do this. And her friend's like, no, Laura, you have to have more confidence in yourself. And <laughs> you just can't believe that someone who would kill 150 people with a rock would mm-hmm. also be that insecure, <laughs> you know? Uh, actually, I've, I've heard the example, too, and I haven't played this game, but uh, I think it's Call of Duty 4, or maybe it was Modern Warfare 2, but uh, there's some war game where where you're you're on a mission and you have a buddy with you, and you can totally just kill your buddy as you're playing the game, but the cutscenes never actually reflect that. So whether or not you kill your buddy, your buddy is there in the cutscenes, and so uh, obviously that doesn't make any sense. But so, I mean, Ted, just generally, where do you fall on that? Udala just issue do you uh, like stories and games or are you kind of against stories and games ah uh, well as a as a game writer i it's probably no surprise to anyone that uh that i love stories and games for me it's like you know why i play i mean that's sort of the point of playing is to sort of be able to lose yourself in sort of this other world you know and, and to experience stories in this new medium yeah uh, speaking of uh good stories and games i uh right now i'm playing bioshock infinite and i'm just uh 
totally loving the the story. I mean, I haven't played Bioshock Infinite, but I was reading a little bit about it. It looks really fascinating. The premise basically is that there's a, a separatist state that kind of built its own flying cities. Uh, so you you visit these these flying cities, and there are themes of racism and uh, the city. It's sort of like a dystopian thing where the the city is ruled over by this guy named Comstock who has a revisionist view of historical events like the um, the massacre at Wounded Knee and the Boxer Rebellion in China. So yeah, I mean, I was reading that one part of the game right at the beginning is that there's a mixed race couple and you're being encouraged to uh, throw a ball at them as sort of a carnival uh, game. Could you sort of describe how that works? So yeah, you're you're in this crowd. You win uh, number seventy-seven. So you you win some sort of uh, a raffle, and uh, I guess then it gives you the right to throw this ball at, at these people. And so uh, you're sort of given this choice: you either throw it at them or not. And I chose not to throw it at them. I threw it at the person who was who made it. So I won the raffle. I threw it at him instead, and I was immediately punished for it. And uh, these sort of uh, enforcers came down and, and a bunch of bad stuff happened and sort of like it started this sort of chase scene in, in the game. So, and I was very curious what would have happened if I had thrown it, but that's, I think, part of the beauty of the game is that you can't really know that. It's like once you make a choice, then, you know, you, you've moved beyond that choice tree and you're, you're in another branch and, and you never know what might have happened. That reminds me of a time in the game Skyrim. Um, there's a, there's an assassin's guild in the game and they, and at some point they sort of kidnap you and they put you in this cabin and uh there's a person who's like in charge of the guild and she's like telling and she's instructing you to kill someone and you're in a room with like four innocent people and they all have like bags in their heads and they've been captured obviously and she says you have to kill one of these people in this room and so I didn't want to do it and so I killed her but uh I just I just thought that was interesting because it is one of those real choice trees and it's like well you're either going to proceed and you're going to join the guild after killing one of these innocent people or um you're going to uh earn the wrath of the guild by killing their leader so the big problem i have have with choice trees in most games is that there's almost always a clear right choice and wrong choice right there's mm -hmm. like the light side choice and the dark side choice and if you make too many light side choices you end up on the light side if you make too many dark side choices you mm -hmm. end up on the dark side but there aren't very many generally speaking ambiguous decisions where you know, it's like a tough choice. I mean, actually, in the Ultimate Games that we were talking about in the interview, uh, at the beginning, what kind of a character class you were was determined by these choices that you made. So, for example, it would say, um, you know, this this guy did this horrible thing, and you swore to track him down and kill him. But it takes you years to find him, and by the time you find him, you find that he's not such a bad guy anymore, and he's adopted this girl, and he's her sole source of support. Do you still do you choose justice and kill him like you swore to, or do you choose compassion and mm -hmm. uh, out of the best interests of this child? And so, I always thought those were so compelling. Um, mm -hmm. But then, unfortunately, in the actual game, you never got very many chances to have those sorts of choices because it's mm -hmm. pretty complicated to play out the consequences of those sorts of decisions. But I, you know, that's always what I wanted to see was more cho ambiguous, difficult choices like that. But yeah, I mean, just speaking of story in games, I mean, I know there are, there are a lot of people who just hate story in games. And playing the kind of games that I grew up on, like the adventure games and the role-playing games like Ultima, I, I never really understood that view. But with a lot of the console games today, I do kind of understand why you would hate the story in the games, or at least that there is... This, a lot of times the story and the gameplay uh, are at odds almost more than they're contributing to each other, because... A lot of the games, like that, like that Tomb Raider game or like um, Uncharted 2, stuff like that, a lot of times I feel like either the gameplay is really good, in which case the cutscenes come to seem like an unwelcome distraction, or I get more interested in the story, in which case the actual game comes to seem like an unwanted mm -hmm. distraction, and I'm just, I'm like, come on, I just want to see what happens in this, next in the story. Right, it's hard to find that balance where the, where the, where the two sides sort of complement each other. It's very difficult to pull that off. I, I just think in a lot of games, the storytelling isn't actually integrated into the game dynamics. I mean, like, like you can't, like some of my favorite games are like Monkey Island 2 and Ultima 7. And you can't imagine those games without the story. Like, if you take away the story, there's not, nothing there. I mean, the game is about the story. Whereas, uh, you know, one of my other favorite games is Doom. And Doom has no story and doesn't need a story. And if you were to have cutscenes in it, I mean, if it was done really well, it might be enjoyable. But 
it becomes much more problematic to integrate it in, in that kind of case where the game doesn't really need the story, you know. In a best case scenario, uh, you could find a way that you wouldn't even need cutscenes. It's like you're actually telling the story within the gameplay, and uh, you wouldn't have any cutscenes at all. Well, I mean, that, yep. but that's been Valve's design philosophy, right? With Half Life and Half Life Two, there are no cutscenes. All the story stuff happens in game while you're running around, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the philosophy, yeah. One of my favorite stories in games has always been Portal and Portal 2, just because, like, it's like a very subtle type of storytelling in the game. And it's sort of doled out so sparingly to the player that once you get to the end of it, it feels like this really amazing story and that you've, that you've actually played through as opposed to just having it told to you, which is what happens in a lot of narrative heavy games, like something like Skyrim, where, um, and I love Skyrim, but it is really kind of, uh, an interactive novel in a, in a way because there's only those certain options that can even be possible. Well, actually, it's, it, it occurs to me that the story of Portal 2 does a really good job of justifying the game conventions, right? Because in a lot of... I mean, essentially what you want in a game is the player has to be limited to one track or a couple tracks. You know, a lot of times, like, streets will be blocked off in a really strangely contrived way or you just find mm -hmm. they're an invisible... For some reason, you can't get to the rest of the city when you should be able to. Mm -hmm. But when the environment is you're trapped in this, uh, you know, obstacle course by this evil computer, then it makes perfect sense why you can't just choose to go anywhere else. Well, I mean, one uh, topic that came up during the interview was what is your ultimate game? So uh, what do you guys think about that? See, John, what is your ultimate? What would be your ultimate game? The only thing that I can imagine as my ultimate game, like, is something that I don't know that you could really make. But I mean, something like Skyrim is sort of close. Like, I mean, I love that type of game or like Fallout 3. Like, both of those games are very close to what my ideal game is. But uh, ultimately, like what you were saying, like if there were more options that the player could actually just really interact with the environment and do whatever they want, that would be the ideal, I think. How about you, Ted? What would be your, what would be your ultimate game? Um, it would be a lot like real life in a lot of ways, and it would be very different from real life in other ways. Um, it would have to be massively multiplayer, just like real life. You'd have to have the ability to interact with other real people, just like real life. One thing that real life isn't particularly good at is sort of finding deeper meaning. Um, there's so much of our daily lives is, is very mundane, and you sort of, you know, you're constantly searching for you know, a way to find, you know, meaning in your life and to feel like you're moving forward and accomplishing things. And I think that's something that could be done very well in the video game space compared to, you know, the average, you know, daily existence of people. So I think it would have to do that. It has to uh, allow you to really sort of explore who you are and discover who you are and find out who you are. And, and everyone, uh, you ha it would have to be possible that your experience could be unique compared to everyone else because you know you are unique compared to everyone else it would be cool like if, if you take what i said but then you also added this other layer to it where uh you sort of incorporate what what dave was talking about earlier with the ultimate games where you you know instead of start at the start of the game you know you answer those questions what would you do in each of those situations you know you play through this grand adventure game that takes hours and hours and hours to play and then based on your choices in the game it actually tells you a little bit about yourself at the end of it because like it sort of like instead of saying, well, what would you do in this situation? It actually tracks what you do in each of those situations. Well, I mean, it seems like like computers are just really good at doing math. And so I think as a result of that, all of our games, all of our, I'll, I'll say all of our single player games are basically built around what computers are good at, which is spatial relationships between objects and inventory management kind of things, uh, which are, you know, you can get a lot of fun out of those, but they're not the most interesting things. And I think what's really interesting is actually navigating social situations. And computers are really, yeah. really bad at that because essentially to have a single player game with any kind of interesting social interaction, the computer has to be at least as smart as a human being to give any kind of reasonable model of their behavior. But if, if we did have AI, you know, some sort of really advanced modeling of intelligence in a computer, and you could have just like a hundred NPCs, uh, you know, computer controlled characters in the game who actually did behave as intelligently as real people. You could have just fascinating, fascinating games like that. I mean, I was thinking my ultimate game really, or at least one I would really like to see would be something where it was like, uh, the beginning of George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, where you're Ned Stark 
and you know that one of your friends has been murdered and you go to the capital city and you have to navigate this web of court intrigue. And even it would be really cool if it were randomized every time. So, you know, different every time you play it, a different person committed the murder, a different conspiracy was behind it all, etc. And it would face you with these really difficult choices like Ned Stark faces in Game of Thrones. You know, who do you reveal what you know to? When do you reveal it? Do you compromise your ethics to protect your family and stuff like that? I mean, it seems like it's hard to get good stakes in a video game like how do you make people feel bad about killing characters when you know they're just video game characters like how do you i mean a, a big part of ned's you know motivation in the story is the need to protect his family and how do you make a player care about the video game character's family you know especially if they can just start the game over you know in a lot of these games, like for instance, for like Fallout 3, they have a karma scale. And, and then so if you do bad things, you know, you get negative karma. If you do good things, you get good karma. And so some of the game is cut off to you if you're too good. And some of the game is cut off to you if you're too evil. Because certain people won't interact with you because you have this reputation. And so that I, I find that interesting. But like the thing is, like, even though like I want to be able to play the game to its fullest, like when I go to play a game like that, I always play the good way. And I always try to be as good as possible. Like I'm like a white knight. Like I just, I won't do anything wrong. And I always, and I feel bad if I ever do do anything wrong. Like for instance, there was a, there was a time in Fallout 3 where um, I said something to a kid and it made him feel bad. And I, and I noticed it gave me negative karma hmm. for it. And I was like, oh, I feel bad now. I actually feel bad because I made this kid feel bad because he was a jerk. And I said, and he, but he was an orphan. And I said, I said something about how he didn't have parents or something. And it was just, it was just <laughs> oh, mean. That's you know? horrible. I know. Well, I know it was just, it was just mean, but um, he, the kid was a real jerk. And so <laughs> anyway, um, I felt bad about it afterward though, you know, but the thing is, it's like, even though I would like to be able to play the game and see all those different aspects of the game that I didn't see because I played it the good way. Like when I go to try to replay it and I try to be evil, it's like, it's not fun to me. Like I don't, I don't enjoy doing it. I think one problem I have with games is that doing the right thing never has bad consequences. You know, I think one of the great insights of Game of Thrones is that Ned Stark is a character who always makes the morally right choice, or almost always, and is punished for it. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be interesting to play a game where making all the right choices dooms you, and you have to figure out how good can you be? <laughs> you know, how much can you compromise your integrity? Mm. So uh, since since we're talking about Game of Thrones and uh, in a game context, has uh, have either of you actually played the Game of Thrones game? I, I, there was one. I, I haven't heard many people talking about it. And games based on properties usually aren't great, so I don't have high hopes. But has it has either of you played it? No, I haven't. I haven't played it. I played the board game. I really liked the board mm -hmm. game. I haven't played either. I think there are at least two computer games. I mm -hmm. don't think either of them were well received, mm -hmm. so I never looked at them. Yeah, I know there's one on Xbox, but uh, I, I haven't played it. But it seems like like they're my my impression is they're they're just making kind of like a Skyrim you know like a Skyrim mm -hmm. type gameplay and just slapping Game of Thrones theme stuff on mm -hmm. it and that seems totally yeah, does, wrong. Does it follow? Yeah, does it follow the story at all? No. You know? I mean, my understanding oh. is that it's like sec they're they're like made up characters in the w wider world, and so you see some of the characters from the TV show and stuff, but you're not playing as them, and the events of the game are peripheral to the main okay to, to any of the 68 main plots of the of the series <laughs> well what um, i want to know is can you monologue while uh prostitutes are giving each other oral <laughs> sex that's that would be my ultimate game really i think <laughs> but just uh, st sticking to game of thrones for a second I, I just think it would be really interesting just um to be able to play as ned over and over again and try different things and just see what the consequences of different hmm. courses of action would be. You know, like if I mm -hmm. took Renly's offer, what would happen? You know, if I took Cersei's offer, what would happen? You know, and, uh, uh, you know, that's... Yeah, that, that is totally, that is totally what a Game of Thrones game should be. You're right. Uh, and then another topic that came up during our interview was just the whole subject of indie games. You know, I have this friend, uh, Keith Bergun, who I went to high school with. We He was our guest geek back in episode 47, and he's an indie game uh, developer. And so I've sp oh, in, uh, in the past couple of years, I've spent a lot of time sort of playtesting his games. Uh, and he's he's sort of a very anti-story guy. He wants you to be able to be making a choice at every uh, moment uh, of the game. And uh, there is something to be said for that, because I, I do really enjoy his games that I played on my uh, iPod. But that's pretty much my only experience with indie games. Uh, mm. What uh, have you guys played? Any uh, any other ones? Or Super Meat Boy is a game I, I've played recently. I really I really loved. And we were talking earlier about 
the way the, the gameplay should sort of match the, the themes of the, of the game itself. So in Super Meat Boy, I thought it was really smart the way, so you're playing this, this hunk of meat that is basically traveling its way through this game. And then what you're always trying to get is your girlfriend. Your girlfriend is this bandage. So it's like Super Meat Boy is like raw meat. You're just like this walking wound where everything hurts you. And, you know, what you're trying to get, of course, is the love of your life or your, your soulmate, which is this bandage girl. And it's like you don't have to explain to, you know, the player why that bandage girl is perfect for, for you because you just know because she's bandage girl. Of course, she's perfect for you. Have you guys seen Indie Game, the movie? Because the developers yeah. of Super Meat yeah. Boy are featured in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, great movie. The guys who did Super Meat Boy, I think one is the programmer, one's the artist or something like that. But the the guy who's more the artist, he uh, he's done a lot of... I don't know if you've ever seen his games. He does really, really bizarre games where you're like a penis shooting semen at a monstrous vagina and stuff like that. They're all these oh, like, yeah. really like super grotesque things. Uh, if you go, go and look at his website, uh, you know, there's just all sorts of weird, weird games on there. Actually, there's a couple other games that were in Indie Game, the movie. Uh, I, I downloaded Super Meat Boy after watching that to check it out, and, and I liked it. I, I haven't gotten too far into it, but um, also there's Braid and uh, is it called Fez? Yeah. So Yeah. Um, and so both of those games are cool. Um, ultimately, uh, my favorite Indie Game, though, is a game called Limbo. And I don't actually remember how I came across it, but it's this like really creepy... That's when we interviewed Ron Gilbert. Oh, did he talk about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so this is really creepy, uh, atmospheric game, and uh, and it's very simple. And that sort of really inspired me to check out some of the other indie games because there was this simplicity to it that modern games tend to avoid. Like, all modern games are often so complex that I, I honestly, I buy them, and then I don't get around to playing them for a while because I'm like, oh, God, it's going to be so much work to actually learn how to play this damn thing. I, I, I look at a game like Skyrim, and I'm like, wow, that looks really cool, but <laughs> I don't want to devote 100 hours or whatever, you know, to play this game, whereas some of these indie games, you know, you, you can play them for half an hour or something, and mm-hmm. you, you jump right into them. Yeah, you don't need to, you know, a lot of them are just side-scrollers. I mean, they're really self-evident. Did you see, um, there's this one, Guacamole? <laughs> Have you seen that? Mm-mm. It's like a, no. it looks really cool. It's a sort of Mexican-themed side-scroller where the sort of basic game mechanic is that you switch back and forth between two parallel worlds at the push of a button. And so in some worlds, there are like, like, so say there's a wall, right? You might switch to the other world. And in that world, that wall is not there. And then you walk past and then switch back, stuff like that. And then some monsters are in one world or the other. And so, you know, if there's a monster about to attack, you can switch out of that world and then run over here and switch back. Uh, actually, and you know, it's, it, although it's not an indie game, uh, the original Portal game actually feels a lot like an indie game uh, at least in terms of like the size of it, because it's like a smaller game. And that was actually one of the reasons that that was one of the things that got me to play it, because um, I hadn't heard of it. And because I've been sort of out of video games uh, for a bit. And so I missed out on a lot of stuff. And so I was at New York Comic Con with our friend Matt London, who has been a frequent guest geek. And I saw all these shirts and stuff that were talking about the cake is a lie. And I was like, what hmm. the hell is that? Like, I don't understand that reference. And he's like, oh, it's this okay. game Portal. It's awesome. And so I was like, ah, I don't, I don't have. And at the time, I was really busy, and I was like, I don't have time to do, to get into a game because like I, I get obsessed with the games, and I and I spend all of my time playing them. And so he's like, no, 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 it's really short and it's not bad. And and, and actually, Ted, I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about the background there because I mean, I think Portal kind of did start as an indie game, right? Like, didn't uh, two students sort of develop the general idea, and then it got developed into what became Portal? Yeah, I believe it was a uh, DigiPen. There was a there was like a class project, and it was called Nebacular Drop. And uh, they come up with this uh, game mechanic where you know conserved physics as you you know fly through these different portals. And it's uh, somehow this uh, class project of DigiPen caught you know Valve's attention. And uh, I know Valve ended up hiring just like a whole bunch of the, the students out of that class. And together, you know, built Portal One. You know, that's mm-hmm. you know it was an amazing, amazing game. And uh, I remember uh, when, I, when I first met you, uh, you were the first per like that was actually the first time I'd ever heard of Portal. You were telling me about hmm. it, and then after after I left and I went home, I immediately you know got the game and was playing it. And I was just totally blown away by it. You know, in our last uh, episode, we talked to Hugh Howie, and he was saying how there's this sea change in publishing where instead of people sending stories to publishers and the publisher decides what things are good and those get the professional release. The people are starting to just publish everything on the Kindle store, 
and then let the readers decide what's good. And then if something becomes popular that way, then the publisher will approach the author and repackage it in a more professional way. And I wonder if we're going to see a similar thing with indie games, is that rather than big developers developing game concepts in-house, you know, lots of these indie games just put out these basic game mechanics with really rough graphics and, you know, limited content and stuff. And then the ones that get super popular or catch the eye of developers, they bring them in and develop them into full retail products. Yeah, you know, one one thing that I find interesting, um, I, I think it was Penny Arcade was sort of talking about, they were talking about indie games a little bit, or at least the, the sort of cheap iPhone game, iOS type game, um, you know, and they were saying, well, is something like Skyrim that costs $60 actually 60 times better than a game that you can get for a dollar on your iPhone? And, you know, I understand that argument because in a lot of cases, it does seem ridiculous. It's like, is it really going to be that much better? And I mean, to me, like something like Skyrim, yes, totally 100%. Like I am down with that. I, that is definitely 60 times more valuable to me than, uh, you know, one of these games that I play on my iPhone. Uh, but But it is an interesting question to, is the value sort of out of whack what we're used to paying for video games toward uh, between that and and what we're getting on on some of these indie games because something like limbo for instance like wow i mean that's like what value i got out of that five dollars that the game cost and and so like that to me would be a much better uh, comparison like is skyrim you know basically call it 10 times more like is it 10 times better i don't know i mean it's certainly i spend a lot more time playing it because it's so much larger but in terms of just the sheer amount of enjoyment I got out of both, like it's 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 much more close to uh, parallel. Well, like I think that the 3D graphics revolution that Austin was talking about has been both a blessing and a curse for the industry because uh, when the 3D graphics first came in, I felt like the game, you know, the actual gameplay had dropped enormously. I mean, because you know we went from games like Ultima Seven, you know, to much much simpler 3D games. And I think only now with stuff like, like Skyrim, are you getting back to the sort of gameplay complexity of something like Ultima 7? And so I, I think it's good in, in indie games that, you know, if, if you don't need the graphics to be so labor intensive, you can actually do more uh, experimental stuff with the gameplay and, you know, maybe develop the gameplay more. Okay. And then, you know, another, another thing that came up in the interview was this whole thing with, you know, uh, Ultima Forever versus uh, Shroud of the Avatar and, and so on. And I mentioned, actually, I, I didn't mention in the interview, but Kick, uh, Shroud of the Avatar was actually a, one of these Kickstarter projects to finance. And we've seen this all sorts of, with all sorts of things recently. The Double Fine Adventure was the big thing that really kicked it off. And I mean, recently, all sorts of things from our childhood have, mm -hmm. you know, are promised to be resurrected, like the Space Quest guys did a successful Kickstarter. The Quest for Glory uh, husband and wife team did a successful Kickstarter. There was the successful Wasteland 2 Kickstarter. Uh, I just saw that the Kickstarter for a sequel to Plane, Planescape Torment just passed $4 million. It's now mm -hmm. the most successful Kickstarter game Kickstarter ever. Um, what do you guys just think about this, this trend of uh, Kickstarted games? Yeah, I'm going to have to learn how to get back into playing PC games because, uh, I mean, I've been mostly a console gamer for the last several years. But uh, yeah, I bought like all those, man. I bought Wasteland 2. I bought Torment Numenera. I bought uh, Shadow of the Avatar. So I'm going to be getting a whole bunch of PC games in, in the near future, and I'm going to have to learn how to play them again. But yeah, no, I think it's awesome because, yeah, we get these games that are sort of being brought back from our childhoods to, you know, revisit them in a contemporary context. Um, and actually, I think Wasteland 2 is sort of a similar situation to the Ultima thing because Fallout actually grew out of Wasteland, the original Wasteland game, but then the developers like had lost the rights. The sort of the rights to the Wasteland franchise were tied up with some other developer. And so but the people had moved on. And so they, they went and they made Fallout instead, um, which is so and it was a different type of game. But the, what they really wanted to make was Wasteland 2. And then now, I guess. Uh, they must have somehow gotten control of the rights back to the Wasteland name. And so now they actually just are going back and making Wasteland 2. So that's one of the most formative games I've ever played. Like, I mean, when I was like 13, I did nothing but play Wasteland, I, I swear. <laughs> and ultimately it led to my first book. So because uh, it started off my uh, my lifelong interest in uh, post-apocalyptic fiction. So, uh, but, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You're Wasteland. And then, Wasteland and then I stole the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as far as Kickstarters, you know, I... When you buy a game, you're voting with your money, right? So I think Kickstarters 
is a way to sort of move that process earlier. So you're not just voting with your money when you buy the game. You're actually voting with your money to get the game made in the first place. So mm-hmm. anything that sort of allows people and the general public and the audience and the people who are going to be actually, you know, playing these games, anything that allows them to have more control over, you know, what they're going to get a chance to play, I think that's a good thing. So I'm definitely in favor of Kickstarters. It kind of seems like Kickstarter or something like it is basically the way of the future in terms of determining what it's worth spending all of our time and money on in, in terms of spending money as a developer. I mean, because I think about this like with anthologies and it's like a lot of it, like it can be very difficult to get publishers to be on board with an anthology. And I'm thinking like, well, even if I had a publisher in mind for a book, it seems to me like it could be very beneficial to everyone to like, well, to do it like as a pre-order thing on Kickstarter ahead of time, because then you know what level of interest there is so that the publisher doesn't have to put out all this money on the uh, ahead of time and potentially have a big uh, disaster on their hand if it doesn't do as well as expected. That way you, you have a lot of information before you even put all of this stuff into motion. This sort of came up, though, in our uh, discussion with Toby last episode is that there's this tendency whenever there's some new opportunity like this for everyone to suddenly say, oh, this is the new normal. The, all the old rules are gone. And I do think that Kickstarter is going to be a valuable way to do, like you say, to uh, to prove that there is an interest in something uh, and, and sort of give it a boost that way. But I don't think that $4 million Kickstarters mm-hmm. for 20, 30 year old game franchises is, mm-hmm. is the new normal, right? No, no. Um, I mean, because I gave money, like like you, I supported Double Fine, Space Quest Guys, Quest for Glory people, uh, Wasteland 2, I don't even know how many others. I don't even own a PC anymore. I have like a Mac <laughs> laptop. I can't play anything on it. But I just have so much, there's such a reservoir of pent up goodwill toward these people who provided me with so much pleasure in my youth. And so I'm happy to give them 50 bucks. And if they never make the game, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm really paying it. You know, I'm giving it to them more in gratitude for what they've already done for me. But that reservoir is not inexhaustible, right? Uh, there's mm-hmm. going to come a point where, you know, I, I'm like, okay, well, I can't just keep giving $50 to, to every 30 year old game that comes mm-hmm. along, you know? Sure. Yeah. You know, no, I mean, Kickstarter fatigue is a real, uh, real issue. Especially in social media, because when you're doing a Kickstarter, and I did a Kickstarter, so I know, but it's really easy to start flogging your product too much. And it's like, it's a really fine line between flogging it uh, too much and not enough to, you know, because you want to make sure that everybody knows about it. But on the other hand, you don't want to annoy the crap out of everybody who's in your, who who follows you or or on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Uh, I mean, I've certainly... I've certainly had to unfollow people just because they were doing a Kickstarter. And it's like, okay, well, I'll, I'll refollow them after the Kickstarter is over because it's like, this is too much. I can't stand to see every day another tweet, another uh, another dozen retweets of other people talking about it. And it's just like, ugh. The indie game movie reminds me of uh, just because when I saw that, I was like really interested to find other forms of entertainment that are sort of related to video games because I'm like really interested in the video game industry and, and, and how, it, how it works and, and, and the creative process. And so I actually came across this book called Extra Lives by Tom Bissell. Um, it's, and the subtitle is Why Video Games Matter. Tom Bissell is like, he's this amazing video game critic. And so this book is basically in-depth criticism of like 10 different games. And so he talks about Fallout 3 and he talks about the Mass Effect series and, you know, several other, Grand Theft Auto 4. And several others. And when I read this book, I was just, I was so fascinated by all of his insights into the different games. And when I came to the part where he's talking about Grand Theft Auto 4, I was kind of astonished because aside from the fact that he was on cocaine the entire time he was playing it, like my experience playing that game almost exactly mirrored his own. And so it was like really interesting and, and kind of validating in a way to be like, oh, wow, well, yes, yeah, somebody else was moved by that game in exactly the same way as I was and liked it for the same exact reasons that I did. Yeah, I mean, there's a really, really good book called Masters of Doom by David Kushner that's about id software and the development of Doom and Quake and sort of focuses on John Romero and John Carmack. And I read that whole book in like an evening. I mean, it's it's absolutely, absolutely couldn't put it down. I really, really strongly recommend it. All right, cool. So, Ted, uh, before we let you go, why don't you tell us a bit about your writing? Uh, you mentioned you've had, what, nine stories in your best anthologies. Uh, how did you swing that? <laughs> Ah, oh, I uh, was just very fortunate. I guess I published my first story in 2005 in Asimov's magazine, and um, I definitely was not one of those writers that you know decided I was going to write and immediately started publishing. That was after about 10 solid years of nothing but rejection. Hmm. Uh, I finally sold my 
my first story. It was really after the point at which I had totally given up. I just assumed that I would never be able to sell anything, but the problem was I couldn't stop actually writing. And then once I was, I would finish a story and I thought, well, I have it written. I might as well send out and get, re- get, get a couple of rejections for it. And so that was sort of the, the process under which I was submitting my stories around the time whenever I finally managed to sell one of them. And then that first sale to Osmos kind of led to everything else, you know, because then I was able to, when I would send my stories out, I was able to say, oh, I've, you know, I've already published one story in Osmos. I think it puts you in a different sort of flush pile at magazines. And then I just started selling pretty much everything I, I sent out would I eventually be able to sell. So, Did, um, did you feel then, like your work was better? Uh, at, like, was there a key change in your work or was it just people yeah, that, that one I, foot in the door did it? I, I, I'm not sure. Well, I, probably it was better, but I, you know, it's hard for me to say better or worse, but it was definitely different because at the point where I totally gave up on ever publishing anything, there was a qualitative change that happened in my fiction. Cause I remember the story where I just decided, all right, screw it. I'm never going to publish anything. I'm just going to write this story the way I want to write it. I'm not going to worry about if anybody gets it. I'm not going to worry about. Uh, yeah, it, like a little editorial voice that was always in my head that was saying, well, you know, this, you know, this isn't going to be clear to people. You know, I, I just turned that off and I said, you know, I don't care if anybody gets this story. I don't care if it doesn't, it isn't going to make any sense at all because at least I know what I'm talking about and I'm just going to write it the way I want to write it because no one's ever going to see it anyway. So it's going to sit in the trunk. So at the point when I started doing that is actually the point where I started selling stories. So then uh, why don't you just tell us about your new novel, Prophet of Bones? What's that about? Uh, Prophet of Bones. It's uh, basically a, it's an alternate history uh, where I grant young Earth creationists their argument. So the Earth really is 5,800 years old, and that becomes the scientific orthodoxy. You know, they're, they're able to test uh, all the scientific evidence demonstrates that the Earth is really 5,800 years old, but, but everything else is the same, right? So we have the same fossil record. We still have you know, dinosaur bones, and we still have Neanderthal bones, and we still have Homo erectus, and you then sort of are forced to confront the fossil evidence with this idea that the Earth is young, and and actually try to explain it within the context of a young Earth, and sort of like the premise of the book is that that is actually a far more frightening idea to, to face than the idea that it's actually, you know, an older, because you have to wonder what are these things that are in the ground? You know, what, what, you know, what, what is a Neanderthal in the context of a 5,800 year old planet? And, uh, the story is centered around the finds, uh, on the island of Flores. I don't know if you've, you've heard about it, but Homo floresiensis, uh, the hobbit, the little three and a half foot, uh, dwarf hobbit that they found on the island of Flores. And there's been a lot of, uh, scientific argument about what this fossil is exactly. And there's, even just a few weeks ago, I think I read another uh, scientific paper where they talked about uh, trying to determine if it's uh, just a pathological, anatomically modern Homo sapien that has, you know, some deformities, or if it's actually, you know, another branch of humanity that split off much earlier. There's some theories that's actually sort of like this uh, isolated uh, remnant population of uh, Australopithecus. I mean, there's just this, this constant argument about what these bones represent. And I thought um, as much argument that is taking place around these fossils now, imagine a world where the Earth is actually 5,800 years old and what these fossils are could actually have, you know, religious uh, significance, you know, or cultural significance far beyond what, you know, exists in our world. So that was sort of a, a kicking off point of the novel. So uh, the novel follows um, a, a researcher who goes on a dig on the island of Flores and helps to dig up these bones. And then he ultimately uh, is going to be doing some clandestine uh, uh, DNA analysis of them. Now, see, I read your story, uh, N-Words, uh, which is just an absolutely brilliant story. It's about a woman who falls in love with a Neanderthal. The, a, a population of Neanderthals have been sort of recreated from uh, genetic samples, right, in the present or the near yes, future. Yeah. Um, and yes. I, I hear there's a, um, a photo of you with a big, uh, skull on your desk or something. Could you talk about that and your sort of background in paleontology or whatever, uh, whatever it is? Sure. Yeah. I actually, uh, when I first started college, I actually, uh, 
had this idea that I was either going to be an anthropologist or a geneticist. And uh, I remember the very first class I took was an anthropology course, and the professor, I think on the very first day, he asked people to raise their hand if they were intending to major in anthropology. And I don't remember if I raised my hand or if I just thought about raising my hand, but anyway, then he sort of like looked sadly at the class, and then he said, well, just let me explain to you what my life is like. And then he basically said he had a master's degree in anthropology and he was an untenured professor and he was it just, he just sort of painted this portrait of you don't want to go into anthropology unless you're sort of independently wealthy and, and don't really need to make a living. And so that told me, well, maybe I better not go in that direction. But So you said it become a science uh, fiction yeah. short story writer instead? Right, exactly. You know, they <laughs> But I decided I actually do need to make a living, so I'm a better hmm. major or something else. But I, I never, you know, I, I still took all the classes, and I still, um, you know, just from the time I was a little kid, actually. I mean, I actually, uh, I was a weird kid. I actually got an interlibrary loan when I was 12 years old from the uh, University of Chicago, uh, a book that was called Human Variation. It was this giant, like, you know, 2,000-page book, and it was just full of this really sort of complex anthropology and genetics, so most of which I couldn't understand, but I was very interested in it. So just from a super early age, I've always been fascinated with, I guess, the, the idea of where we come from and, and why we are the way we are. So so I just I majored in biology instead, and uh, then I just sort of kept anthropology as a sort of side interest of mine, and I and I kept uh, reading up on it, and I would, uh, you know, I still take classes, and I just didn't, just didn't major in it. But then I ended up having to drop out of college uh, later on, so it it was all sort of moot at that point. Okay, but somehow so, you ended up working in a lab with a big skull on your desk. Hmm. Oh, okay, yeah. The, uh, so the big skull on my desk is actually, uh, the skull is on my desk at home. It's actually a, a recreation of um, a Neanderthal skull. It's the old man a la chapelle aux saints. I'm probably pronounce, mispronouncing that, but uh, it's uh, uh, actually was like a birthday present. And... More recently, I have an actual museum-quality replica of the uh, the Hobbit skull from Flores. So the story, you know, the skull that I wrote uh, wrote the novel about. Actually, have my my wife bought me that for uh, for my birthday. So yeah, it's not really uh, work related in any way. It's just sort of uh, hmm. side interest related. So I note that uh, N words accounts for two of your year's best appearances. Uh, where did that story originally appear? Oh, that appeared in uh, a little anthology called Seeds of Change, edited by, hmm, let me think, uh, John Joseph Adams. Yeah, Just wanted was, to pat uh, myself on the back there. Well, you, you deserve it, because that, uh, <laughs> that story had been rejected elsewhere, so you were the first person to uh, take a chance on that story, so the fact that it ended up in two years' best, I think, was a good vindication. All right, cool. So, Ted, why don't you tell us, uh, what are you working on now? you have anything coming up? Um, I'm working on my third novel, which I don't really have a title for yet, but it's based on my short story, uh, Divining Light. And it's a sort of a quantum mechanics madness story. Uh, the, prim the general premise is a, uh, a mentally unstable physicist discovers a flaw in reality. And so you sort of follow, uh, what happens, uh, with the development of that. And other than, you know, writing another novel, I'm also writing for Dota 2, so I'm hard at work, uh, Every day of Valve, uh, working on that game. All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So, Ted, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks again to Austin Grossman for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Fred Keish. And big thanks to Andrew Johnson for becoming subscriber number 45. To see a list of all our subscribers, visit our website at geeksguideshow.com and click on subscribe. And if anyone out there still plays Doom 2 and wants to try out one of the awesome deathmatch levels I made, visit my website at davidbarkirtley.com, click on blog, and then click the link that says Best Doom Deathmatch Map Ever. And as we mentioned, we'll be wrapping up the show today with a special presentation of my fantasy short story Save Me Please, that's with please spelled PLZ, which is all about video games. The story originally appeared in the October 2007 issue of Realms of Fantasy magazine and was reprinted in the anthology Fantasy the Best of the Year 2008, edited by Rich Horton. The story also appeared as episode 124 of the Escape Pod podcast, so if you enjoy it, you should definitely go check out some of the other Escape Pod stories over at escapepod.org. 
Save Me Please is performed by author and podcaster Mer Lafferty. And you can find out more about her at merverse.com. That's M-U-R-V-E-R-S-E dot com. And so how I came up with this story was that back when I was in grad school at USC, I was involved with the Secular Student Alliance. And one of the young women I met through that club told me that she had started playing World of Warcraft. And I was kind of like, oh, that's cool. But then she said that the reason that she had started playing World of Warcraft was because her boyfriend was so addicted to the game that really the only way that she could interact with him anymore was if she logged into the game and appeared as a character in that world and talked to him that way. And I just thought that was so sad. And just the look in her eyes when she said that, she just had this really forlorn look in her eyes. And I just wanted to write a story somehow that captured that emotion. And so hopefully it does. Uh, the story's gotten a good reaction. As I said, it was in a Best of the Year anthology. And it got me what's probably my all-time favorite piece of fan mail. This was from a young woman in France, and she wrote this note that says, quote, I came across your short story, Save Me Please, on your website maybe a year and a half ago, and I liked it. I actually forwarded it to a friend of mine, who I was really worried about then, because he spent so much time playing MMOs and wasn't doing well, failing his studies and kind of withdrawing from us. Reading the story was apparently a turning point for him, a wake-up call if you want, and it's great to see that he is doing much, much better now. He even said once that the story saved his life. So obviously it meant a lot to me to get that. And I hope that piques people's interest enough to give the story a try. But if you're not interested, you can stop listening now. There won't be any more show after the story. All right, and so without further ado, let's get to our story. Save Me, Please by David Barr Kirtley Meg hadn't heard from Devon in four months, and she realized that she missed him. So on a whim, she tossed her sword and scabbard into the trunk of her car and drove over to campus to visit him. She'd always thought that she and Devon would be one of those couples who really did stay friends afterward. They'd been close for so long, and things hadn't ended that badly. Actually, the whole incident seemed pretty silly to her now. Still, she'd been telling herself that the split had been for the best, with her working full-time and him still an undergrad. It was like they were in two different worlds. She'd been busy with work, and he'd always been careless about answering email, and now, somehow, four months had passed without a word. She parked in the shadow of his dorm, then retrieved her sword and strapped it to her jeans. She approached his building. A spider, dog-sized and iridescent, rappelled toward her, its thorned limbs plucking the air. She dropped a hand to the hilt of her sword. The spider wisely withdrew, back to its webbed lair amid the eaves. She had no key card, so she waited for someone to open the door. She checked her reflection. Eyes large, hips slender, ears a bit tapered at the tips. She looked fine though she'd never be a match for the imaginary elf-maid, Lena. Finally, someone exited, an unfamiliar brown-haired girl. Meg caught the door and passed into the lobby. She climbed the stairs and walked down the hall to Devin's door. She knocked. His roommate, Brant, answered, looking half asleep or maybe stoned. Hey, Meg, Brant mumbled, casually as if he'd just seen her yesterday. How's the real world? Like college, she said, but with less art history. Is Devin here? Devin? Brant seemed confused. Oh, you don't know. He hesitated. He dropped out. What? She was startled. Just packed up and left, weeks ago. He said it didn't matter anymore. He was playing that game all the time. Brant didn't need to say which game, least of all to her. He said he found something huge in the game. Then he went away. Went away where? Is he all right? Brant shrugged. I don't know, Meg. He didn't tell me. You could email him, I guess, or try to find him online. He's always playing that game. Brant shook his head. And I mean always. Meg strode back to her car. She chucked her sword in the trunk, slid into the driver's seat, and slammed the door. Devin was the smartest guy she'd ever met and the stupidest. How could he drop out with just one year left? Sadly, she wasn't all that surprised. She'd met him at an off-campus party her junior year. They'd ended up on the same couch. Before long, he was on his third beer and telling her, I didn't even want to go to college. My parents insisted. I had a whole other plan. She said, which was? To be a prince. 
He gave a grandiose shrug. I think I'd make a pretty good prince. He noticed her skeptical expression and added, But not prince of, like, England. I'm not greedy. Prince of Monaco would be fine. Wait, is that even a country? Yes, she said. Good, he declared, thumping his beer on the end table. Prince of Monaco. Or if that's taken, Liechtenstein, she suggested. Liechtenstein, great, he agreed, pointing. Or Trinidad and Tobago. She shook her head. It's not a monarchy. No princes. No princes, he feigned outrage. Well, screw them, then. Liechtenstein it is. After that, she noticed him everywhere. He seldom went to class or did coursework, so he was always out somewhere, joking with friends in the dining hall, pacing around the pond, or sitting under a tree in the central quad, doodling. His carefree independence was oddly endearing, especially to her, who was always so conscientious, though later his indifference to school worried her. She'd ask, What do you do after you graduate? He'd just shrug and say, Grades don't matter, just that you have that degree. And now he'd dropped out. Angry, she started her car. She drove back to her apartment. She emailed him repeatedly, but got no response. Mutual friends hadn't heard from him. His mom thought he was still in school. Meg got really worried. Finally, she resorted to something she'd promised herself she'd never do. She drove over to the mall to buy the game. It was called Realms of Eldritch, a groundbreaking multiplayer online game full of quests and wizards and monsters. Some of it was based on real life. People carried magic swords, and many of the enemies were real, such as wolves or goblins or giant spiders. And like in real life, there was a gnome who sometimes appeared to give you quests or hints or items. But most of it was pure fantasy. Dragons and unicorns and walking trees and demon lords. And elves. In the game store, Meg eyed the box art. Lena, the golden-haired and impossibly buxom elf maid, grinned teasingly. Meg had a complicated relationship with Lena, especially considering that Lena wasn't real. The year before, Meg had been thumbing through Devin's notebook and come across a dozen sketches of Lena. The proportions were off, but each sketch came closer and closer to being a perfect representation. Meg had begun teasing Devin that he was in love with Lena. Meg had also, once, foolishly dressed up as Lena in bed for Devin's 21st birthday. It was just a campy gag, but he'd seemed way too into it. He'd even called her Lena. She'd never worn the costume again, and he'd never brought it up. He'd been pretty drunk that night, and she wondered if he even remembered her looking like someone else. She bought the game, planning to return it the next day, and started home. A flock of giant bats tailed her, and she kept them in her rearview mirror, ready to slam the brakes and dash for the trunk, but finally they veered off and vanished into the west. Back at her apartment, she opened the game box and dumped its contents out on her coffee table. Half a dozen CDs, a thick manual, some flyers, a questionnaire. It seemed so innocuous. Hard to believe that this little box could destroy a relationship. She and Devin had been so happy together for almost a year before he got caught up in this game. She installed it. As progress bars chugged, she thumbed through the manual, which described the rules in mind-numbing detail. Races, classes, attributes, combat, inventory, spells. She'd never understood how someone as smart and talented as Devin could waste so much time on this stuff. Maybe she could have understood if the game at least featured some brilliant story, but Devin spent all of his time doing level runs, endlessly repeating the same quest over and over in hopes of attaining some marginally more powerful magic item. And even after he'd become as powerful as the game allowed, he still kept playing, exploiting different bugs so he could duplicate superpowered items or make himself invincible. How could someone who read Heidegger for fun so immerse himself in a subculture of people too lazy or daft to type out actual words, who, instead of someone please help, would type S-U-M-1-P-L-Z-H-L-P? Meg, on the rare occasions that she permitted herself solitary recreation, preferred Jane Austen novels or independent films. She'd once told Devin, I'm more interested in things that are real. He'd been playing the game. Monitor Glow made his head a silhouette. He said, What's real is just an accident. No one designed reality to be compelling. He gestured to the screen. But a fantasy world is so designed. It takes the most interesting things that ever existed, like knights in armor and pirates on the seas, and combines them with the most interesting things that anyone ever dreamed up. 
fire-breathing dragons and blood-drinking vampires. It's the world as it should be, full of wonder and adventure. To privilege reality simply because it is reality just represents a kind of mental parochialism. She knew better than to debate him. But she still thought the game was vaguely silly, and she refused to play it, though he often bugged her to join in. He'd say, It's something we could do together. And she'd answer, I just don't want to. And he'd say, Give it a try. I do things I don't want to do because they're important to you. Sometimes I even end up liking them. But by then, Meg had already spent far too many hours sitting on the couch watching him play the game, or hearing about it over candlelit dinners, and she didn't intend to do anything to justify him spending any more time on it. It was hard some nights, after they'd made love, to lie there knowing that he was just itching to slip from her embrace and go back to the game, to know that a glowing electronic box full of imaginary carnage beckoned him in a way that her company and conversation and even body no longer could. Finally, she couldn't take it any more. Though she knew she might lose him, she announced, Devin, look, I don't know how else to say this. It's that game or me. I'm not kidding. He released the controls and swiveled in his chair, looking wounded. After a time, he said, That's not fair, Meg. I'd never make you give up something you enjoyed. She stood her ground. This is something I'm asking you to do. For me. You really want me to delete it? Yes, she said. Oh, God, yes. He bit his lip, then said, Fine. He turned and fiddled with the computer, then turned back to her. There. It's gone. All right? All right, she said, euphoric. And for a few weeks things were great again, like they used to be. But one night she came over and found him playing it again. She stared. What are you doing? He glanced at her over his shoulder. Oh, hi. He noticed her agitation and explained, My guild really needed me for this one quest. You told me you deleted it. He turned back to the screen. Yeah, I had to reinstall the whole thing. Don't worry, I'll delete it again tomorrow. Meg was furious. You promised. Come on, he said. I haven't played for three weeks. It's just this one time. She stomped away. I told you, Devin, this game or me. Isn't that what I said? Meg, don't leave, okay? Would you just... Something happened in the game, and he jumped. Shit! He got me! She left, slamming the door. Devin called out, Meg, wait! But he didn't run after her. She expected him to call and apologize, beg her forgiveness. But he didn't. Days passed. Then she sent him a curt email, saying that maybe it would be better if they just stayed friends from now on, and, disappointingly, he had agreed. The game finished installing. Meg hovered the mouse pointer over the start icon. She felt strangely ambivalent. She'd fought so hard against this damned game, and now she was actually going to run it. She also felt an inexplicable dread, as if the game would suck her in the way it had sucked in Devon, and she'd never escape. But that was silly. She'd just use it to contact him. She double-clicked. The game menu loaded. She created a character, choosing all the most basic options. Human, female, warrior. The name Meg was taken, so she added a random string of numbers, Meg1274, and logged in. The game displayed a list of servers. Meg did a search for his character, Prince Devonar. He was the only player listed on a server called Citadel of Power. She connected to it. She typed, Hi, Devon. No response. She tried again. Devon, it's me, Meg. Are you there? Finally, he answered. Meg? She typed, Are you okay? A long pause. I found something. In the game. Unbelievable. But now I'm stuck. Need help. Was this whole situation some elaborate setup to get her to play the game with him? But that was crazy. Not even Devin would drop out of school as part of such a ruse. She typed, Devin, call me, okay? Another pause. Can't call. Trapped. Please, Meg, help me. You're the only one who can. I can't help, she typed. I'm only level one. Not in the game, he typed back. In real life. Ask the gnome. Please, Meg. I really need you. Can't stay. Meg, save me, please. She typed frantically. Devon, wait. What's going on? Where are you? But Prince Devonar was gone. Devon had said to ask the gnome, but that wasn't so easy. 
No one really understood what the gnome was. He seemed to wander through time and space. He was usually benevolent, appearing to those in need and offering hints or assistance or powerful magic. But he was also fickle and enigmatic. He seemed to only appear after you'd given up hope of finding him. He also seemed to prefer locales with corners that he could pop out from and then disappear around. So Meg parked downtown and wandered the back alleys. She couldn't stop thinking of Devin's final words. Save me, please. If only the gnome would show himself. Hours passed. Forget it. She was going home. She crossed the street. And then the gnome, before her. Crimson-robed, white-bearded, flesh like dry sand. One eye brown, kindly. The other blue, inscrutable. In a soft and alien voice, he observed, On a quest? Finally, she wanted to grab him. Where's Devin? Tell me. This is your path. The gnome pointed to the road at her feet, then westward. Meg nodded. I'll follow it. The gnome turned his kindly brown eye upon her. Have no fear, though obstacles lie in your way. Your victory is assured, foretold by prophecy. When the warrior maid with love in her heart sets out, sword in her right hand, wand in her left, nothing shall stand before her. Wand, she said. The gnome reached up his sleeve and drew forth a thin black rod, two feet long. He whispered, The most dire artifact in all the world, the wand of reification. He handed it to her. It chilled her fingers and was so dark it seemed to have no surface. He said, Imbued with the power to give form to dreams, it may only be used three times. Devin had said once that in the game there were items that vanished after you used them. So he never used them. He'd beat quest after quest without them, though they would have aided him considerably. He was always afraid he'd need them later. He'd ask, What does that say about me? And she'd say, You're afraid of commitment? And he'd laughed. It wasn't so funny now, though, clutching this wand, so potent yet so ephemeral. How could she ever use it? When she looked again, the gnome had vanished. Meg retrieved her car and set off the way the gnome had pointed. The road, a double yellow line and two lanes of black asphalt, bordered by sidewalks. She drove. Skyscrapers and then suburbs fell away behind her. She passed clusters of thatched-roof cottages. Men farmed and cows grazed and mill wheels turned. Sometimes ancient oaks pressed in close to the road. Sometimes she saw castles on distant hills. The needle on her gas gauge sank and she hoped to find a station, but there were none. Finally, the engine died. She left her car and set off down the sidewalk. Twilight came. Then the long line of street lamps lit up, casting eerie white splotches on the darkened street, creating a tableau somehow dreamlike and unreal. She thought of how Devon and Brant would sometimes smoke pot and then get into long, rambling discourses on the nature of existence. During one such conversation, Devon had said, do you know anything about quantum mechanics? Not really, Brandt had replied. So Devin said, Well, in the everyday world, things exist. If I leave a book on this table, I know for sure that it's there. But when you get down to the subatomic level, things don't exist in the same way. They only exist as probabilities until directly observed. How do you explain that? Brandt countered. How do you explain it? Devin smirked. Like this. Our world isn't real. It's a simulation. An incredibly sophisticated one, but not without limits. It can keep track of every molecule, but not every last subatomic particle. So it estimates and only starts figuring out where specific particles are when someone goes looking for them. That's so weird, Brandt had said. Meg heard a vehicle approaching from behind. Then its headlights lit the street. She glanced back into the glare, then kept walking. The vehicle slowed. It followed, in a way she didn't like. Finally, it pulled even with her. A black SUV, its windows open. Out of the darkness came a rasping, lascivious voice. Hey, where are you going? She ignored it, walked. Need a ride? The voice waited. Hey, I'm talking to you. A long pause. What? You too good to talk to us? When Meg didn't answer, the voice hissed. Bitch! 
and the driver gunned the engine. The truck sped off. Meg watched it go, then watched its taillights flare a sudden red challenge, watched it swing around, its headlights sweeping the trees, watched it come on, two coronas of searing white. Cackles rose from its windows. Meg drew her sword and stepped into the street. The car horn shrieked. She slashed upward between the lights and the truck split. Its two halves swept past her on either side. Its right half sped into a tree. Its left half flipped over and rolled thirty yards along the pavement. Meg followed after. She neared the wreckage. A scraggly vermilion arm reached up through one window. Then a face appeared. Hairless, dark-eyed, ears like rotting carrots. A goblin. He squirmed free and dropped to the ground. A second goblin crawled from beneath the wreck. The first drew a long, wavy dagger. Look what you did to my truck! But before he could start forward, the second grabbed him and leaned in close. It's her! The facilitator! The first goblin studied her, and his eyes widened. He sheathed his dagger. So it is. He touched two knuckles to his gnarled red brow. I apologize, my lady. We owe you much. The goblins edged around her, then hurried over to the other half of their vehicle. They dragged out two more goblins, who were seriously injured, and departed together. And then they were gone. But their words stayed with Meg, and perplexed her, and troubled her greatly. She had other adventures, vanquished other foes, and the road led ever on. Finally she came to the peak of a rocky prominence and looked out over a mile-long crater. The street ran downhill until it reached the gates of a dark and forbidding fortress. She knew that this must be the citadel of power, and that Devon must be within. She hiked down to it. The drawbridge had been lowered. She eased across, sword in her right hand, wand of reification in her left. The portcullis was up, and the gate lay open. She slipped into the yard. Empty. She crept sideways, keeping the wall at her back. She held her breath, heard nothing. She peeked into the central yard and saw a grand stone altar. She crept closer. An object lay upon it. A wand. The wand of reification. She glanced at her left hand, which still held her wand. She'd thought it unique. She already had a wand of reification, and hadn't even used it. She shrugged, took the second wand and tucked it into her belt, then moved on. She searched bedchambers, kitchens, a great hall, a cavernous ballroom, all empty. She encountered an ancient armory, crossbows, shields, pikes, wands. Rack after rack of wands, hundreds of wands, a thousand? Wands of reification, all, she felt sure. She didn't understand. She went outside and crossed the yard again. The sky had begun to dim, and now she saw faint light in a tower window. She ran toward it. Which hall? Which way? She dashed through rooms and under arches and up spiral stairs. Finally she found it, a door shut, wan light spilling from beneath. She hurled herself against it and burst into the room, sword raised. A bedchamber, posters on the walls, Devon's posters from his old dorm room. Light from a computer monitor. Someone sat before it. He turned. Devon. He smiled and said, Meg! Hey! She ran to him and folded him in her arms along with the sword and wand and everything. She said, Are you all right? I was so worried. I'm fine. He squeezed her and chuckled. Everything's fine. He pulled back, brushed aside a lock of her hair, and kissed her. He was so tall and handsome, tawny-haired and emerald-eyed. He wore a gold medallion over a purple doublet with dagged sleeves. Come on, you're exhausted. He led her to the bed, and they sat down together. He took her sword and wand and laid them on the nightstand. She rested her cheek against his shoulder. She stared at the familiar posters. The nearest was an Edmund Leeton print, and whispered, Aren't you in trouble? I thought you were, Devin. I don't understand what's happening. Shh. He stroked her hair. Just relax, okay? I'll explain everything. He said that the real world was just a simulation, like a game. He didn't know who'd made it, but whoever they were didn't seem to show themselves or ever interfere. Like any game, it had bugs. Many of these involved realms of eldritch, 
which was itself a new, fairly sophisticated simulation, and sometimes things got confused, and an item from the game got dumped into the real world. That's how he'd gotten the wand of reification, which could be used to alter almost anything. With it he'd set things in motion. He said, Do you understand so far? She nodded tentatively. It was all so strange. He said that since the wand could only be used three times, he'd had to go looking for another bug, some way to duplicate the wand. Fortunately, there was one, but it was very specific. If a female warrior set out to rescue a man she loved and was given the wand by a gnome, the game set a quest tag wrong and let her acquire the wand again at the Citadel of Power, leaving her with two. Devon said, Ah, speak of the devil. Meg raised her head. The gnome, his head canted so that his mysterious blue eye watched her. Devon reached for the nightstand, took the wand, and handed it to the gnome. Meg murmured, Why are you giving it to him? Devon said, So he can give it to you again. The gnome stuck the wand in his sleeve, gave a curt nod, and hobbled from the room. Meg was mystified. You said this bug creates an extra wand? Yes. She thought of the armory. But you have hundreds of wands. Over a thousand, Devon said. He took the spare wand from her belt and placed it on the bed. One for each time you've come here. One thousand two hundred and seventy-four wands. She was stunned. But I don't remember. He told her, somewhat cryptically, when you restart a quest, you lose all your progress. Meg stood, pulling from his embrace. Devon, you lied to me. You said you were trapped here. He stood, too. I'm sorry, I had to. You had to be on a quest to save me, otherwise it wouldn't work. She fumed. I was in danger. I was attacked. He held back a smile. And what happened? I... She hesitated. I beat them. Of course, Meg. You're level 60. You have the most powerful sword in the game. Nothing can harm you. There was never any danger. Didn't you get my prophecy? Your prophecy? That's why I wrote it, he said. That's why I made the gnome recite it, so you wouldn't be afraid. She paced to the window and looked out. This was all too much. So now you've got a thousand wands. Why? What are you planning to do? He came and put his arm around her and said softly, To remake the world. To make it what it should have been all along. A place of wonder and adventure. Without old age or disease. A place where death is only temporary, like in the game. You're going to make the game real, she said. Yes. She felt apprehension. I don't know, Devin. Maybe you shouldn't be messing around with this. I like the world just fine the way it is. Meg. His tone was affectionate. You always say that. She felt a sudden alarm. What? Again he suppressed a smile. It's already begun. Ages ago. You think the world always had goblins and giant spiders and a gnome running around handing out magic items? That's all from the game. I made that happen. She felt adrift. I don't remember. Nobody does, he said. The wand makes things real. Not just physical, but real. Only I know that things used to be different. And now, so do you. And the goblins, Meg thought. They knew. Devon kept going. That's what's so funny, Meg. No matter what I do, no matter what crazy and congruous reality I create, you always want things to stay exactly the way they are. That's just your personality. But we can't stop now. There's still so much to do. And you'll love it when I'm done. You'll see. You have to trust me. I don't know, she said. I, I need to think about it. Of course, Devon replied. Take all the time you need. So she stayed with Devon at the Citadel of Power, and they ate meals together in the dining hall, and danced together in the grand ballroom. And after that first night they slept together again, too, and he was so beautiful and strange. She was still in love with him. She always had been. Even the game knew it. They hiked together around the crater's rim, and he told her of the world as it had been, where there had been no magic at all, and humans were the only race that could speak, and adventure was something that most people only dreamt of. It sounded dismal, and yet Meg wondered. Could you reverse the process? Put everything back the way it was? Devon was silent a while. It would take a long time. But yes, I could. Is that what you want? I don't know, she said. That night, Devon told her. 
I want to show you something. He led her to their tower chamber and turned on his computer. Meg was suddenly nervous. The monitor flickered. Icons appeared. Devin said softly, Look at my background. It showed two students sitting on a couch at a party. Meg didn't know them. The girl was pear-shaped and frizzy-haired and wore thick glasses, and her nose was too big. The guy wore glasses, too, and was gangly, with thin, lank hair and blotchy skin. They looked happy together, in a pathetic sort of way. Meg said, Who were they? Devon said, That was the night we met. Meg was horrified. She looked again, and suddenly she did recognize traces of themselves in the features of those strangers on the couch. Devon explained, I used the wand on us. Nothing drastic. I could do a lot more. I could make us anything we want. But you need to understand, Meg, when you talk about putting things back the way they were, exactly what you're saying. Meg could accept the way she looked now, merely a pale shadow of Lena. But to think that she might not even be pretty, might be that girl. I, I thought you should know, Devon said, apologetic. The next day at lunch, Meg asked him, What is it you want me to do? He lowered his utensils. Start the quest over. How? He nodded in the direction of the tower. On my computer. I can show you. So that you'll get another wand? She said. Yes. And I won't remember any of this. No, he said. She leaned back in her seat. How many more times, Devin? My God, how many more wands? As many as it takes, he said, without equivocation. She stood from the table. She said, I need to think, alone. He nodded. She went and paced the castle walls. Devon wanted his new world more than anything. If she went along, then together they could have immortality and adventure and opulence and wonder. What had the old world offered? Crappy jobs and student loans? Illness and death? What kind of choice was that? She'd been here, before, even if she didn't remember, and had sided with Devon 1,274 times. Who was she now to doubt the wisdom of all her past choices? He was still sitting there when she returned and said, Fine. Show me. He led her to the tower and loaded the game. He selected a character named Meg, who looked exactly like her. The character was level 60, and carried a sword of ultimate cleaving, plus one hundred. Devon clicked through a few menus, then stood. Okay, you have to do it. Meg sat down at the computer. A box on the screen said, Citadel of Power, are you sure you want to start this quest over from the beginning? The mouse pointer hovered over yes. Devon leaned down next to her. Are you ready? Yes, she whispered. He kissed her cheek. I'll see you again soon, okay? Okay, she said, and clicked. Meg hadn't heard from Devon in four months, and she realized that she missed him. So on a whim, she tossed her sword and scabbard into the trunk of her car and drove over to campus to visit him. Ages passed. And now, Lena the Elf Maid is the most beautiful woman in all the world, and her lover is the most handsome man, Prince Devonar. They journey onward together, battling giants, riding dragons to distant lands, and feasting in the halls of dwarven kings. The prince is incandescent with joy. He was born for this, and Lena enjoys seeing him so happy. She loves him. They ride two white unicorns down a forest path blanketed with fresh snow, and by some strange twist of magic or fate they come upon something that should not exist. It lies half buried in the drifts, but Lena can see that it was once a sort of carriage made from black metal. It has a roof, and its underside is all manner of piping, rusted now. Long ago, someone had sliced it in half. Where its other half may now lie, none can say. The prince leaps from his mount and circles the strange object. What foul contraption is this? Lena drops to the ground, too, and staggers forward. A strange feeling passes over her, and a teardrop streaks her cheek. She can't say why. Soon she is sobbing. The prince takes her in his arms. My lady, what's the matter? He scowls at the object. It's upset you. Here, it shan't trouble us any longer. He pulls the wand of reification from his belt and aims. No! She pushes his arm aside. Leave it, please. He shrugs. As you wish. But come, let's away. I mislike this place. 
he mounts his unicorn. Lena stares at the strange carriage, and for a moment she remembers a world where countless such things race down endless black roads, a world of soaring glass towers, of medallions that spoke in the voices of friends a thousand leagues distant, and where tales were told with light thrown upon walls the size of giants. Films, she remembers. Independent film. Jane Austen. But the moment passes, and that fantastic world fades, leaving only the present, leaving only this odd, lingering sensation of being trapped in someone else's dream. She mounts her unicorn, and three words stick in her head, an incantation from a forgotten age. She no longer remembers where she heard the words, only that they now seem to express a feeling that surges up from somewhere deep inside her. Save me, please. All right, so that was our show. Thanks to everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your hosts, visit johnjosephadams.com or davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by Slipgate 9 Entertainment. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.